Okay, so we're going to miss a few people's intros, um, but we do record the sessions, and uh, I, I later put them up on YouTube. So if people want to review things, um, there's a, a, a year and a half or so of the videos there now. If you want to go back and read them, uh, or listen to them, whatever, um, and you can ask me questions about them if you want. Um, but it is a uh, just a good way of, of archiving things, and I know sometimes. Um, uh, people like to go back over them to review things that you know went by too fast in the conversation. So uh, certainly they're available for people. Um, okay, uh, so Jim. Hello, um, I'm familiar with the group. Uh, I'd like to be ev for every session, but it doesn't always work out like that. Um, <clears throat> I'm a I own a production studio. I do uh, music and video production. Well, you know whatever um, people need in that realm. So it's one of the creative realm. My degrees are in, both degrees are in psychology. I have my, uh, my bachelor's and my master's, but I used it just to understand people because I'm better with machines and um, engineering and technical things like that than I am with understanding how people work. So when I first started, it wasn't going too well because I could understand why people were doing the things they did. Um, so psychology helped me to understand that and be able to um, process it in real time with with uh, custom clients and most of them are very creative so you know creative people tend to be hard to difficult to <laughs> understand well i'm you know what i mean like did re there really some, really right cat, right there's some cat herding involved yes yeah yes so <laughs> so uh but i'm creative too i just have, well i've left playing component as well um heidegger i did i've never read this before um i skimmed through the first part I, I wanted to watch the video, but I didn't have time, but I did read chapter two and um, I'm familiar with Heidegger, uh, A, because I'm friends with Jason and, and uh, we also have been over being in time some other things um, that Heidegger's worked on. I really, really like uh, his philosophy. Uh, I like uh, in particular what he's doing in this book is, is um, trying to really dig in and this chapter on the medieval thing. So uh, I don't want to go into all that. I'm just here to say, yeah, read it. Uh, I have yep. a lot of questions as I always do. Some of them were answered later on, but I'll still ask them if time allots um, so I can hear what people think and I can make sure that I understood the text properly and uh, et cetera. But I um, okay. love it. And that's me. Thanks. Okay, great. I mean, it's sometimes hard to do these round robins when everyone's jumping around, but uh, let's, uh, let's jump down to James in the lower row. If you can get off mute. Oh, thanks. Um, Second James. Yeah, sorry. Do you go by James or Jim, by the way? Because other James goes by Jim. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, um, I'm going to have to uh, leave, and I'm going to try to with Hegel. So yeah, I hope you guys have a good meeting. Thank All right, you. thank you. Sorry, <laughs> that's some background noise there. Um, uh, Karen, did you do the reading? Have you done the previous Hi. reading? Hi, I'm Karen. Um, I attempted to do this reading. I did not do the previous reading. I did get the book and look over it. And I'm so thankful for others here saying that they had difficulty with it because I have no background in philosophy. And it really <laughs> shocked me <laughs> when, I, when I tried to read that, um, how difficult it was. But I'm really here today to listen and uh, see a little bit like what this is about. Um, I've just had a recent interest in philosophy. Um, my background is I studied risk management. I work in insurance. Um, I am trying to improve my life and leave some behavioral addictions. And I've, I believe that some of my issues have stemmed from coming up with really dysfunctional existential answers. Um, and so I would like to find better answers or at least acknowledge that I don't know and throw out those old answers. So good to meet all of you and don't call on me because I'm here to listen. <laughs> That's just you. fine. That's just fine. <laughs> okay, um, uh, Nick. Nick, you. Yes, no. Um, if not, uh, uh, is it Manthe? Uh, hello. hello. Um, uh, my name is Manthe. I am from Greece. Uh, I have uh, 
taken the initiative to join today because uh, I would like uh, to listen about Heidegger in general and whatever you will discuss. Uh, because, uh, to be honest, I don't uh, know about Heidegger many things, but uh, I hope to learn from uh, you today. And uh, also, I want to ask something if I can, uh, and if it can be answered, because uh, uh, of my university. So I hope uh, to listen. Yep, and uh, questions are fine when they come up in, in the context, and if you uh, save them to the end, that's fine too, uh, but... Uh, or I can write it in the chat, probably. You can do that too, absolutely. Okay, okay, right. And, and, and welcome. I think we had one person from Poland back when we were doing uh, Heidegger and Nietzsche, uh, but other than that, you may be the farthest one away. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you, sure, and welcome. nice to meet you. Likewise. Uh, okay, Dan? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, you're good. So my name is Dan. I'm a, I'm a scientist. Uh, specifically, I'm a, a statistician. I live in uh, Southern California. Um, I start to read. I Actually, I have an interest in philosophy for a way back. But about two years ago, I, I started to read Heidegger in kind of a systematic way. And I'm since then, I'm moving through his works. I think I read probably over 30 books by Heidegger in the last two years. And at the same time, I started to read a lot of, you know, when you need to go back, I kind of read almost the entire German idealism, like especially Kant and Nietzsche, all their works and Hegel and Schopenhauer and so on. And not just philosophy, but also like in some economics, some politics and stuff like that. And also went back to the Greeks. I read a lot of Plato and Aristotle also because it needs to to be done if you read, if you want to understand Heidegger. And uh, well, I think I read this book about six months ago. Like for example, now I just finished Nietzsche for the volume one and two week ago. And I started, I think it's the question of truth when he discusses Plato and the, the, the Alete and all that stuff. I mean, now started that book. So yeah, I read the book about six months ago and that's okay. pretty much me. All right, great. Uh all right, so um, I don't know if we have time to do a round robin of first impressions. So instead of doing round robin and calling on everyone, some who don't want to be called in anyway, uh, why don't I just instead throw the floor open and uh, uh, if someone wants to give first impressions, they haven't gotten a chance yet, uh, that it could include um, problems you had reading the chapter, challenges, someone mentioned already the translation issue, but um, uh, anything you want uh, covered in the discussion um, or just first reactions to, uh, the content of chapter two. Joe? Uh, yeah, I'll go first. Uh, my first impressions with chapter two, uh, first I was very pleased as we delved into the scholastics because when we were reading earlier uh, the book by um, the French Gilson, Gilson yeah. uh, I, I noticed that there seemed to be this issue that uh, earlier the earlier writers didn't seem to have existence included. They had essence. And he, so he, he carries that through and it just puzzles me a bit. And then sort of existence sort of pops in because it's so, existence is sort of the central point, I think of the modern area, modern, <laughs> modernist idea. Actuality is the word that Heidegger finally brings us uh, from Kant. But I was quite interested in how this whole thing progresses because Heidegger clearly brings them all back together by going back to the original Greek and, and talking more about, you know, how the words were used and puzzled me how the, how the essence existence distinction sort of disappeared and then reappeared uh, in, in modern times. And I think it's very interesting to sort of follow that, that, that discussion. Yep, no, it, it's a good comment, but I just, just for orientation for others here, I mean, one of the issues here is just language that um, uh, essence and existence are both Latin words, right? Um, we get that distinction in that form in Latin. Um, and the usual term that the scholastics use when they want to say existence is not existence, it's S, E-S-S-E, -S -S -E, right? So they're distinguishing between S being and essence, which is something like being-ing, right? Um, and uh, um, 
that's the sort of the first form that you get it sort of verbally in in Latin. Now that's not the first form which you get, get it uh, generically because it's there in the Greeks. Uh, the discussion of, of it is, in, is there in the Greeks, but obviously not those Latin words. And especially in the medieval Arabs, um, in people like Avicenna, um, lesser descent of Arawese. But Avicenna is, you know, crucial for all of this, and he's, you know, he's reading and writing in Arabic, um, and he he's reading Greek things and he's uh, commenting on them in Arabic, and that Arabic gets translated into Latin, and then people read that. People like Aquinas read that Latin translation of Avicenna for uh, understanding of a lot of concepts in Aristotle, um, including a lot of these essence uh, existence distinctions. So um, the essence existence distinction that you get in the high, high scholastics is often informed by sort of original Greek ontology translated through uh, Arabic and the particular mind of Avicenna and then coming back as essence existence. The thing which is closest to the essence existence in the scholastics is for um, Averroes, a distinction but just between the two questions. Well, you know, what a, what a thing is and whether a thing is, as Heidegger puts in this chapter. Um, and uh, so the, the what or whether questions. Um, and that does go back to Aristotle. Um, Aristotle uses those terms as well, but obviously in Greek. Um, but he's obviously not using the term essence or existence. The term which is normally being translated being from the Greek is, uh, and it's talked about here, is usia. Um, but the colloquial meaning was he is something like substance or wealth. Um, and it's in Aristotle, the thing which you get when you put a form and a matter together is the full being, which has the usia. And usia is a technical term in um, both neo, uh, Middle Platonism, Neoplatonism, and Christian theology uh, uh, bef before all this time, before the scholastics proper, and people like Bothius and uh, uh, Augustine and, 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 and that sort of period. Um, okay, but uh, anyway, all, the point is all of that is background to um, uh, the essence existence distinctions in the medievals. The concepts are there, but the words aren't. And, uh, and how the translations happen and the language they pass through sort of matters for where it gets murky or where it gets clear. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is the people in this tradition are all disagreeing with each other, right? So <laughs> uh, it's not like they just can't keep the distinction clear in their head. They're having violent disagreements about how the, how the things actually work, either metaphysically or uh, uh, psychologically or you know, terminologically, whatever. We'll get to that too when we get to some of the scholastics themselves. Um, it's, not, it's not the case that each one of these eras has no major disagreement in it. There's a major disagreement between Plato and Aristotle and the Greeks, and between people like uh, uh, Ghazali and Averroes among the Arabs, and between the three uh, uh, scholastics that he's highlighting here, um, and between Heidegger and, and Kant in the modern time, right? So uh, um, Heidegger is certainly trying to point to things which he thinks are the sort of um, accepted in that tradition that give it a kind of uniformity that he is gonna be reacting to but keep in mind that there are definitely distinctions within each of those periods as well. And we'll talk about some of those, especially in the case of scholastics, because they matter here. Not all of them ones that he brings out, uh, that is Heidegger brings out in the chapter. Um, but uh, the, the thoughts are distinguished in the Greeks, especially in Aristotle, but the words aren't until the high scholastics. And even then they start off by just using S for what later is, you know, turned into existence. Um, I hope that helps. Um, any questions about either that or uh, uh, other first reaction questions or? I can give a first reaction if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, please. <clears throat> I thought it was great. Um, specifically, it was interesting to me the way Heidegger's writing it, approaching it. It sort of reminds me of um, reading a novel or watching a film where you're thrown into the protagonist's struggle issue and there's a there's an immediate need or a question that needs to be answered almost like an inciting incident or something like that and uh i guess you know aristotle would have put that in the poetics but anyway it starts off like that we're going to solve this problem we're going to try to figure out what's going on and while he's doing that so you have your attention like yeah let's figure it out he gives you all kinds of great history with the medievals 
And I just loved how he did that. So, I, you know, it keeps you engaged because you want to find out what the answer is, but you also get all kinds of good backstory, you know? Uh, and uh, I, I was fascinated by um, the extent to which he went into with the, with the medieval thinkers and this classics. I do have some questions about Leibniz because that came up immediately in my mind um, <clears throat> when it came to, into Essentia and all that. So I'll wait for, for that, but um, okay. I loved the way he approached it. And I, I, I thought it was great in that regard. Good. That was my first impression. Good reaction. Let's table Leibniz for now. We will bring it yep. up, especially there's, especially he's talk, he talks about the uh, Leibniz, about the principle of uh, sufficient reason. Um, Leibniz is also known as the guy who thinks of um, essence as possibility. He talks mm -hmm. about you know, the possibilitas connection of, uh, of Leibniz. And Leibniz is, of course, the uh, all possible worlds theoretician uh, after Descartes. Um, but the main, main focus of the other people in the chapter, besides the background of Kant is, and the foreground sort of of the ancients is the scholastics. So I don't want to distract too much for bringing in every other person in, in, in philosophical history. We can get to the Leibniz detail as, as a detail, but uh, in terms of the overall pacing of the chapter, um, uh, uh, <sighs> There's a, a fair amount of it which just looks expository, which is just you know sort of laying out the history of these uh, of these scholastics on, on a problem, and it's not necessarily meant to be entirely flattering to them, right? In the sense that they they come off you know confused, they come off you know um, uh, uh, debating secondary points and, and not seeing the main one, um, and that's part of that's partly by design. It's partly also just that it's a very complicated murky subject and he can't bring in everything that's actually involved in these thinkers. He's, just, he's trying to focus on his own problem. And it's important to understand that as he's going through there, he's not presenting these people's problematics in their own terms. It's not, he's, he is giving you like the distinction between, um, you know, a real distinction, a formal distinction, a distinction of reason only. That is exactly in the originals. He's being entirely faithful to all that, right? But uh, he's not bringing in the concerns about the problem universals they all have. He's not understanding the way they think of uh, uh, being in the unrestricted sense. Uh, he, he sort of uh, thinks that that's, he calls it a blind alley at one point. Um, uh, so there, there, are, there are things like that where you have to understand that he's not simply um, accepting the take of the people he's, expo being, uh, he's explaining to you, right? And by the end of the chapter, right, that is, you know, on... Um, has you know uh, gone vertical, right? He has he has taken that to the point of saying, you know, um, uh, this whole tradition uh, has a has a a clear uh, rootedness or background to it, and we can find out what that is. And uh, he, he speaks of a, a term from uh, Kant about asking for the birth certificate of an idea, right? Where did this idea come from? Um, and is the birth certificate legitimate, right? He, he claims that he's found the birth certificate of, uh, of essence and existence mm -hmm. and, can, and can relate them back to the fundamental structure of uh, human Dasein from which they stem. And then he also claims that this is, uh, might be okay for the realm of nature, but it's not okay for being in the unrestricted sense. Um, so there's all these giant claims by the end of the chapter, right? So he starts off with this very careful exposition of these detailed concerns of the medievals. And then, you know, it just goes into the gas pedal is hit. And, and the, by the end of the end of the chapter, um, you get these very extreme claims about the uh, um, limited nature of the understanding that they all had of the issue they were wrestling with. Um, and, uh, that's the, uh, I think uh, one person mentioned before, you know, this, this, there's this pattern of setting up something and then knocking down that straw man, right? Uh, 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 to make a point uh, that is certainly going on. That's also um, uh, deconstruction down to the roots in his own terms uh, of, uh, mm -hmm. of desedimentation of the tradition to understand, you know, where its pieces came from. Uh, uh, it's also crazily ambitious, um, not to say, um, flippantly dismissive of, uh, of great philosophers before him. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's, he's uh, uh, no one ever accused Heidegger of humility, right? Um, so uh, uh, that's, that comes out by the end of the chapter. Um, okay, and the other thing is that this chapter is also connecting tissue. It's meant to hook up at the end to the next chapter because at the end of the chapter, we get the, the introduction of the problem of, the, of consciousness um, 
uh, and the distinction between the way of being of consciousness and the way of being of extant things or things of nature or material things, um, which is going to be the mm -hmm. info to the way in which the distinction between thinking things and extended things is thought of in, in the modern uh, metaphysics. Um, but the reason that came up is, you know, first of all, he explained, he tried to explain everything about how um, the medievals and ancients thought of being ex the being existence distinction by rooting it in something, you know, semi-psychological, if I can call it that way, anthropological in the structures of Dasein and its possible comportments, et cetera. Um, but uh, uh, also the, the, the knock he had against the uh, essence existence understanding on the part of the medievals and ancients was that it claimed to be about being in general, but in fact, it was only about the being of nature, right? And that it doesn't generalize the claims that it makes are not obviously true of the kind of being that we ourselves are, right? That's sort of the claim by the end of the chapter. And that's why this hooks up to the next chapter of he's, you know, he's, he's detected what he claims is a failing in the medieval ontology and its precursors back to Plato and Aristotle. Whether he has or not, we have to assess, right? We have to see, you know, does he, this is a big claim, does he substantiate this claim, et cetera. Um, uh, so as we go through understanding it, we have to pay attention to what he's telling us about the medievals, what the medievals actually understood, what Heidegger might be missing in the medievals, the places where he surreptitiously, you know, puts in his own, uh, his own thoughts into them when they don't have yet. Um, but then also, you know, before we get done, we have to grapple with his uh, claim to have understood the original experience of the distinction between essence and existence. Um, he claims he's found the phenomenological first cause of where those notions came from in the first place. And by the way, just in passing, he also tells you where the idea of matter comes from um, and uh, claims that all of them are rooted in a particular possible comportment of the Dasein. So, I mean, you, you cannot get bigger claims in like the last 10 pages of the chapter. <laughs> so just keep that in mind as we're, you know, uh, as you go through the, uh, the minutia of the, of the um, scholastics, it might not be clear what's at stake. What's at stake really only comes out toward the end um, when he drops his bombshells. Um, I hope that that helps just sort of general orientation of, of the thing. The basic claim of the chapter is that the entire tradition had a notion of essence and existence, which was only true of being of nature's and it applied them to everything, including uh, human being in a way that just isn't true. And Heidegger knows why. Okay. Um, so uh, another way of thinking about this is there's an element of deconstruction. There's an element of setting up a straw man and knocking it down. There's also, uh, you can think of this as a genealogy of essence, right? Um, in terms of like what uh, some previous philosophers had done um, or some later philosophers who mimic, mimic this method. Um, the other thing that's worth noting is that uh, although it's not highlighted here, there's kind of the, there's kind of a, um, a big opponent in all that who isn't mentioned in the chapter heading. He's not Aristotle, it's mentioned in the chapter heading. And he's not the subject of the main uh, trio of the chapter, the scholastics, and that's Plato. Because when he goes back to explaining where this essence idea comes from, he, he, he grounds it in Plato's understanding of ideas. And uh, the, uh, there's a critique of the, uh, of the ideas uh, in this, which is not the same as the historical critique, right? Uh, when I say historical critique, I mean the, the one that was made by you know, people like uh, Aristotle and accepted by people like, uh, that, that you know, took Aristotle's side in that and, and called themselves Aristotelians on that basis, right? That's, you can call that the historical critique of, of Plato, the way in which philosophers after Plato decided they weren't Platonists and went in other Aristotelian directions, right? But um, that's not the critique of Plato that uh, he Heidegger is making here because he's seeing more continuity between them than that. Um, but uh, you have to ask um, the people who he's talking about here, they also had various reactions to Plato. They also had various ways that they understood these things. He doesn't talk about it here, but they're actually disagreeing violently on the problem of universals all through the scholastic period. And he just sort of doesn't mention it. 
And that's also related to the places where he sees um, misunderstandings and quote, blind alleys on their part. Um, especially um, in their own self-understanding, the scholastics are think that the first distinction they make is between infinite being and limited being. And of infinite being, they uh, think about it in this very essentialist way, which is very platonic. Um, and they have all their disagreements about finite being, but they have enormous amount of agreement on infinite being. And in all that, they're disagreeing with the Kant we saw in the first chapter, and they're all agreeing with each other and with Avicenna and with Plato, um, and not necessarily with Heidegger. So anyway, the, the point is, pay attention to the silences as well as the claims, is what I'm trying to say. There are strong claims being made against Plato, but there's also places where there are silences about the people he's talking about and what they thought about Plato. Um, Suarez, he, he practically conflates the position of Suarez and Don Scotus, for example. He presents their, their modal distinction and, for, and uh, um, a distinction of reason answers to the question of the existence of the finite being. He presents that as practically the same as one another. And that's the self-understanding of Suarez. Suarez thinks that he has fully explained everything that Don Scotus needs, and he doesn't need Don Scotus's position anymore. It's fully assimilated by him. But that's only what Suarez thinks. That's not what Don Scotus thinks. The reality is they're disagreeing violently about the universals. Um, Suarez doesn't think there is such a thing as real universals outside the mind, right? There are no, there are no universals in things. There are only similarities. Minds put all the, all the um, uh, equivalences there that, there, are, there that there are. In medieval terms, he was a conceptualist, not quite a nominalist, but uh, certainly not a realist on the problem of the universals. Don Scotus is a realist on the problem of universals. He thinks there are real essences in things. So of course they're going to disagree about the relationship between existence and essence and finite being, because one of them believes that essences are real and they're in the being, they're patterns and things, and the other one thinks that essences are just in the mind, right? But because he never mentions the problem of universals here, you know that just never comes up. He just accepts Suarez's characterization of Don Scotus's position. Don Scotus says, "Yes, I understand why you made this modal distinction, but that modal distinction is really just made by the mind, and it's all in the mind." And Heidegger just accepts that. Um, Don Scotus wouldn't accept that. And the reason Don Scotus wouldn't accept that is because he's more of a Platonist than Suarez is or than Heidegger is. Right, so keep track of those. Um, that what I'm trying to say is there, there are positions, as an argu positions and arguments here that are not being set. Um, okay. Uh, but when you're first learning the tradition, it can be incredibly hard to notice that. If your first one explaining the tradition to you doesn't bring it out, how are you gonna know that it's there? Uh, the way you're supposed to notice is, he didn't really say very much about Don Scotus's position here, did he? He kind of jumped right from Aquinas' position to, uh, to Suarez's position, and he kind of left Don Scotus out. Why? Does it have anything to do with the other the, the places coming out about Plato being wrong about the ideas? Um, because Don Scotus agrees with Plato more on that point. Anyway, this is, uh, the person he's arguing against is not necessarily the people he's explicating in the chapter. That's the thing I'm trying to point out, right? Um, and a, a unified platonic metaphysics in the tradition is a major thing he's taking on. Um, and it's useful to sort of notice that. Okay, this is just general things about the whole chapter. Uh, there's tons of actual um, content to get through. Uh, I wanna give other people a chance to ask one more question or react to anything I was just talking about um, before we try to get expository about the bits. Mm -hmm. Is that Nick? Yes. Oh, go Nick. Yeah, I thought I'd just jump in. I, I, I mean, having missed the, the main or the, the jewel, I guess, in the last 15 pages, I kind of felt, though I, although I did start reading on it, I still got the sense that this is the meat of it. I, I think the thing that that I found uh, worth worthwhile in spending all this effort was his turn in terms of Heidegger's turn in terms of like uh, the idea of es, essentia and uh, uh, what is the other term uh, essence and essentia were looked at mostly by philosophers like Kant from a cognitive standpoint, from an understanding. 
sorts. And he started turning, I think, in this in the last 15 pages, where he starts talking about it from a standpoint of production or action. Absolutely. Which is kind of a to me, a, oh, what a great way of looking at it. What things can you discover by doing right. that? Probably not right. in a monological so, way. So, so, yeah, so, so, you're absolutely right that he, he is distinguishing the productive comportment understanding of these things and the productive activity understanding these things from the um, sort of receptive, conceptual, passively viewing, right? And he is saying that the, that, that Kant is more on the second of those, the theory end of the spectrum as opposed to the, the, the uh, production end. Mm -hmm. He's not bringing that out just as his own take on it. <clears throat> He's claiming that that productive view is actually back there in the Greeks the Greeks, yeah. and 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 that and that the the basic understanding of the relationship between essence and existence that you get in Plato and Aristotle, where they agree, no disagree, he's, he's claiming, mm -hmm. is coming not from the theoretical comportment but from the productive comportment. And if you were looking at it from the theoretical comportment lens, if you were if you were if you were Husserl and you were just trying to look at the phenomena as as the uh, uh, as experienced, right, you might have this. Uh, uh, the theory lens, and you would think that the uh, um, uh, the essences come long after the existent thing. First, you orient on the existing thing, which is the basic uh, core thing that's the carrier of the properties, and then you discover the properties about it. But Plato puts it sort of the other way around. You first have the model of the thing, and then you make the thing. Right. And Heidegger's claim is that the precisely the direction in which Plato thinks of the <clears throat> The being of the thing and the model of the thing and the essence of the thing that makes it actual as being the form and not the instance, that's what tells you that he's coming at this from the productive, not the theoretical comportment. He's coming at it from a productive lens because that's the way the artist thinks, right? He's giving you an origin of the idea of model, right, in what the artist does, uh, artist in the sense of um, producer or something. Um, but he's claiming that not as his own insight, but as the basic orientation of Plato. And uh, so, so with all that might be true or false about that, right? That is all the ways in which that might be accurate, all the ways that might be insightful, but also all the ways that might distort the phenomena, right? He's, he's ascribing that not to himself, but to Plato. Right, but I take it as his reading of Plato, his, his interpretation of Plato, which he adds in, which could be correct or not correct, but it's not something that is generally thought of. I don't think in in the in the field. So correct. I'm this thinking... is it's definitely it's definitely Heidegger's claim or insight that that is there. He is original in that respect, and it's not simply a reading of Plato. It's a it's a it's meant to be a bit of detective work of why is this essence coming first yeah. instead of coming second. Yeah. Right. But this is the thing that I find like it, uh, Arendt does the same thing. Uh, well, of course, she's a, she's a student. Of, she was a student of Heidegger as well as a lover, but, but she also goes back to the Greek always, to the meaning of the word in Greek, mm -hmm. and, and and tries to mine that to interpret modern phenomenon in the same way that I think I'm seeing it, this this trend with Heidegger, and 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 this idea of action, of course, blends right quite right in with the being in time design of, of the handiness of. Of sure. and so forth right so so it's a good good, good so the, term. And, and there's no question that heidegger's own position like respect compared to husserl is he, he's accentuating the practical as opposed to the <laughs> theoretical right being in time isn't isn't like uh husserl's ideas because it isn't as theory like it's more focused on the practical aspects of the life world right yeah. um so so you're right that the sort of move to pra practice is kind of his own signature thing but here he's not ascribing it to himself. He's ascribing it to the, the essence metaphysics of Plato, which mm -hmm. plenty of people uh, read as being, you know, uh, uh, the apotheosis of theory, mm -hmm. right? And he's mm -hmm. saying, no, it's actually all about, uh, it's all about uh, um, uh, artificial uh, creation acting in the equipmental context. That's what you actually get from the Greeks, right? Is the claim. Um, which is a strong claim. He makes it uh, versions of that in some places, uh, some other places about Plato. Um, but uh, 
how much the ideas, for example, are a, um, a purely theory based as opposed to a practical based uh, understanding, open question. Um, he, he's making very large claims on relatively thin evidence is the way I would put it, right? But they're very large claims. Um, but this is still phenomenology, right? That's my question, I guess, because as I'm reading him, I'm seeing how his mind is doing, how he's nitpicking at stuff and looking at it, kind of uh, analyzing. Sometimes to, to add nausea, I feel like, like there's so much, there's so much garbage so, you have to go through. To so get so, to the so I, 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 I would but call it genealogy because, he, because what he's doing is he's, he's trying to explain a, uh, something in the tradition, right? That he sees there. And yes, he's going to, there's the phenomenological thing is he's going to try to find um, what original experience uh, motivated the tradition to go in this direction instead of some other possible direction. Um, but that's not simply him doing the phenomenology himself. It's him ascribing a phenomenological observation to his distant predecessors, right? Mm -hmm. He thinks he's seeing phenomenological thinking in Plato and Aristotle when they first wrestled the problem, and then he's diagnosing naivete and how they did it. By the way, we've got some echo uh, somewhere. Uh, I think, Jeff, you might need to go on mute. I think I'm on mute already. What, 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 okay. Little, hmm, I'll figure this out. Yeah, it's me, but I don't know how to, oh, here it is. Yes, so uh, uh, yes, the technological stuff, which we got uh, about 10 years after this, certainly continues some of this thinking about uh, uh, the productive comportment. Um, you can also say that it's not just uh, Heidegger who has this interest slash problematic, right? There's, uh, there's obvious echoes to uh, uh, Marxian theory. There's also um, uh, things that you get uh, similar to list in Hannah Arendt um, and uh, uh, Man the Maker, Homer, Homo Faber, uh, there's, there's, this is not just uh, something which is exclusive to Heidegger, right? Uh, this this uh, general understanding of things by the uh, the making side of it, um, it's it's a it's a philosophical theme. There's there are people in the early modern times who who make the claim we know only what we make, right? We uh, only have thorough understanding of something we can engineer it. So that's the only way we know that we know uh, how it works inside. This is echoing that too. Um, uh, but the other claim you see in the in the in the chapter is he claims that this um, at, at some places that this um, insistence that everything has to be understood as created um, is dogmatically insisted upon f by some of the medievals for mm -hmm. purely theological reasons, mm -hmm. right? It's a it's a it's an ontological uh, sorry onto theological uh, you start from the assumption that the world has to be created. And then you find the find the philosophical understanding that that that, that comports with that, right? You're you're putting putting the big metaphysical conclusion in at the beginning. This is what the uh, what of Maimonides would call the uh, the sin of the muta kalum, kalum the, the theologians, the Muslim theologians who, who reason for what they want the conclusion to be backwards instead of uh, forward from the evidence was the claim the Aristotelians made against them. And he's making that same kind of claim here about uh, Aquinas insisting upon the uh, creativeness of everything, um, and you know that uh, that that Aquinas in particular needed there to be a real distinction because without it he did not see, did not see how in this metaphysics uh, mm -hmm. true true creation was possible, right? Um, so uh, what I try to get at is that whole galaxy of claims in the chapter are not just saying um, productive thinking you know clear and good, right? Uh, uh, theory thinking, uh, you know, distant, cold, and not so good. There's nothing like that, right? Um, there's ways in which um, the understanding of the uh, meanings of beings purely in terms of uh, the productive comportment simply um, limits and distorts the phenomena. There are other ways in which it brings out insights about the phenomena, in particular, this issue of releasement, he, which he notices in the, in the productive comportment. And that's where he's definitely doing phenomenology. His, his point is that um, in, in production, the person doesn't simply want to remain the author of the thing he's producing. 
He wants it to be finished and released and stand on its own. It needs to be, it needs to be completable in the sense that the thing created to be created has to be able to stand on its own. It can't be something which just subsists in something else. It has to exist in its own right, right? Um, and that that's part of uh, the understanding of, you can put it this way, the being things have in themselves once produced that he traces back to the productive performance itself. So partly this is sort of the Kantian kind of thing. The Kantian kind of thing is to uh, read uh, some of the universals that previous philosophy saw in the world as projections of the mind instead of as things out in the world. And he's doing a little bit of that in, in saying that some of these um, ontological structurings of the way in which beings have to be put together are really coming from a um, something about how Dasein has to relate to the world, right? Which is not quite a psychological projection and it's not quite a uh, um, just a Kantian uh, uh, shadow of the mind or something, but it's also not simply that Plato and Aristotle um, went and looked and saw the bones of being and have explained them all to us, right? Without distortion. Does that make sense? It does, but it's also funny how Heidegger never seemed to finish the thing that he said he was producing. <laughs> Yes, it's a common failing. <laughs> uh, the other, the other thing is just you, 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 you. The question you should definitely be asking is: These are very interesting claims. They're very bold claims. Does the evidence support them? Is the evidence too thin for them? Right. Um, but uh, it's something I ask myself when I read uh, chapters like this. Okay. Uh, I wonder if if that is the right question for philosophy, though, because evidence and so forth. I mean, it is one question. But, but, but there's also the other question that pragmatists like to put forward is, is how useful is this? Sure. In, 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 and, and does this make things, uh, does it make sense more? And does it... Sure, uh, but the interesting question in this chapter is uh, which way does that one come out? Um, because Heidegger's whole argument against these people is not that their understanding was not useful, it was that he wants to examine the birth certificate of where their, uh, where their notion came from and, and challenges legitimacy, which is an evidence kind of question, not an outcomes kind of question. Um, so the standard he's applying himself is not, you know, their way of thinking isn't as useful. Um, I don't think it was the standard they were applying themselves either. I think that uh, they, they thought they were just getting at the truth of things. Um, they were not trying to give a practice. They were not pragmatists yet, uh, if yet is the right word. Um, okay, but uh, uh, these are all good reactions, but I want to jump into the explication of the three main characters of scholasticism because there's a whole bunch going on in them. He uh, uh, mostly gives them fair shake, but others not. Uh, there's a, he mentions two particular works. Uh, he mentions this one. Uh, this is a youthful thing by uh, Aquinas that he mentions. It's very short. Um, uh, on being in essence. And one of the things which might not come out from his discussion of it is that a huge portion of that is concerned with um, how conceptual apparatus works and how generals and particulars and uh, individuals work, right? In other words, when, when the scholastics are thinking about problems of essence and, 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 and being, they're also thinking about questions of universals, of general of what is a schema in the mind and what is a reality in the things and so on. Um, so a lot of that is the, is, the, is the actual subject matter of this little thing. Um, the other one he mentioned is, um, this is from uh, Suarez's, um, uh, Suarez's uh, philosophical uh, metaphysical dispu disputations. Um, one of the standing scandals in the modern world is that, is that although it is 2000 pages, you can understand, 2000 pages of Latin for Suarez's metaphysical disputations, um, maybe a quarter of it has been translated in English at this point, all as typically books on just one to three sections of it uh, out, of the, out of the 50 or so. Um, but uh, this is how much you have to go through of Suarez. Um, and he, he, he mentions this book and then he says, oh, well, not you a completely historical thing. And then he brings up this book, which is, you know, 
a much easier book if you have it in front of you. <laughs> um, but uh, those are the places where uh, sort of the primary sources uh, he's, he's pointing back to uh, for the two main arguments he's making about what Aquinas thinks and what Suarez thinks on this question of um, uh, existence. Uh, we should first just make sure we understand how, how delimited the problem is. Um, mention also Duns Scotus in between them. Um, and maybe a little bit of background to Aquinas from uh, Avicenna as a fourth person here who's barely mentioned. Okay, what are they talking about? They're, talk they're trying to talk about in an actual existent thing, um, is there a distinction between the essence of that thing and the existence of that thing? And if so, what is it, mm -hmm. right? So they're not talking about a possible thing and an actual thing, that sort of difference they all recognize. Uh, it's an actual thing in front of you. Um, but it had, it had or has some essence, which is some uh, set of real properties like it, its, its structure, its relations, its, uh, its program, its, uh, its information content, something like that. But it also has its uh, individual instance, actuality, uh, being in time, uh, um, um, in, presented, in presenting itself, uh, ness, whatever that is sort of just very rough outlines of what the two things are. And the question is, we know that we can distinguish those things if you're talking about the thing not being and then being, uh, but can you see a distinction between them uh, when the, you have the actual existing thing in front of you? And if so, what is that distinction? Okay. And the different positions on that are, yes, there's a real distinction between them. And by real, we mean an essence-like distinction between them. He, he, he points out that many of them are arguing well, they call it real, but it's not a thing. And we'll come to that in a second. But the people who are saying that it's a real distinction are not saying that that distinction is a thing. They're saying that it's essence-like. Okay, that's the first point. Uh, the, sec the second group, uh, uh, the uh, group person, uh, uh, Scotus is saying um, there is a modal distinction. There is a real, there is a real distinction in the, in the object, but it's, uh, it's only a distinction of mode of, uh, um, that, that, they, that they're a way in which you can consider it a projection of, uh, of a direction of consideration and they are actually there in the thing, they have a real support in the thing, but it's only a modal distinction, not a real distinction. We have to talk about what that means. And then Suarez says, no, there's only a distinction of reason between them, which is the same as saying for an actual existing thing, it's existence and its essence are exactly the same thing. You only distinguish them in your mind. They're different for the mind, it's the mind and its purposes, which is distinguishing them. The thing itself, and here's the strongest claim in Suarez, um, before it is actual, it, isn't, it is nothing. So Suarez doesn't have real essences in things. And so he also doesn't have essences that don't yet exist. Essences that don't yet exist are nothing, as Suarez. And this is why a lot of his positions on this one come out of his position on the universals. Right? He wants the individuals to be the real things and their and essences to only be abstractions or to only be concepts. So they only have real existence. Well, they only have actual existence, the right way of saying it. They only have actual existence in the mind. Okay, and that goes back to um, Aristotle's criticisms of Plato, uh, that his ideas aren't real things, that they're only uh, abstractions, et cetera. That's sort of where Suarez comes out on all that. Um, okay. So that's just, are the basic three positions of the three guys uh, clear? Not only the three positions, but also what it is they're trying to talk about, or is this hopelessly obscure in the scholastic sense? A question. I got a lot of homework now. <laughs> Pete, you got a lot of, a lot of uh, flair there. I, I'm blinded by the light. Um, Jason, can I ask uh, just just a procedure, just because this sure. is my first time here, but I was wondering, how do you go about this? I mean, I, I enjoy the lectures and so forth, but do you also go into the close reading of, of the book or you do? I, I, I'm absolutely yeah. willing to go into close reading of the book, but I need someone to ask about a passage or bring up a passage. Uh, we're, we're not going to go through it line by line because with this number of people, there's no, there's no chance. Um, but I do expect that if someone had problems with a particular area, especially if it's something we're talking about, that they'll bring it up, point to a passage and say, what did he mean here? That's absolutely on point, but I need a, I need a orienting question uh, to go to that level, if that makes sense.
I have them, but I, I don't. I want to make sure that I'm not asking questions that don't uh, Go for it. specifically. Go. <clears throat> Well, the first one, I, I think we already passed this. That's my problem. Like, um, the part where I, it, it says, um, and I don't, my pages are going to be different because I'm looking at, you know, a, a Kindle, not a book. Sure. Um, the problem of God toward the concept of God as the ends perfectionism. That's what I was asking. Is it referring to Leibniz and Spinoza specifically or just the argument in general? So I under, I wanted to make Got sure it. I understood that. Oh, very, very. So you're on page 79 in our, in our pageations. Um, and uh, it's not too, we should definitely go back to it. It was one of the things I was going to go to next, but. Um, uh, okay, sorry. And, and that's not just Leibniz. That's also the understanding that we saw in the ontological proof that goes back to Anselm. And we heard in the previous chapter that that actually goes all the way back to Dionysus, the area, uh, pseudo Areopagate and so on. Um, and you will find versions of that in, uh, uh, in Avicenna, right? So uh, whereas um, it's not something that, Kant agrees to, or Heidegger agrees to, and maybe not something that Suarez agrees to, but the, um, uh, so he, he says, Aristotle's old identification of first philosophy, science of being with theology receives renewed confirmation. And here's where he doesn't bring out exactly why this is the traditional understanding of the scholastics and we have to go into it. And the answer the reason is, what a surprise, Plato, right? <laughs> so, Avicenna has a very simple concept of God, being itself. And uh, when he says being himself, he, said he, he also means infinite being. And uh, people like Suarez will say, no, 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 infinite being is you know, only one subdivision of being. Being in general is way more, is, way, is entirely different from infinite being. Infinite being is only often the special uh, ontology for theology. When we're talking about God, then we're talking about infinite being. We're talking about being in general, we're talking about something much simpler and, and vaguer than, than infinite being. To which the response is, being without restriction is what infinite means, right? The fin in finite is, is, a, is an end, which is a restriction. So being in general, being without restriction and infinite being are exactly the same thing. I just used a Latin word once. So this is the way Avicenna understands infinite being as being in the unrestricted sense. So he doesn't have this, uh, Don Scotus, not sorry, Don Scotus, this uh, Suarez schema of general ontology and then uh, uh, theology is over here inside special ontology as only one of the three spheres of God, cosmos, uh, mind, right? That's Suarez's thing. He's got generality, which is this sort of basic logical way of thinking about things. And then there's those three special things you can think about, God, nature, or minds, right? That's Suarez's scheme. But that's not Avicenna's scheme. In Avicenna's scheme, infinite being is the top. It's the first. It's the first topic, and and uh, 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 there's places there where he says um, it is what is meant in first sig first signification, and Heidegger treats that as just a sort of sort of passing passing honorific, a, a bow to the direction of God that you have to make right before going on to the philosophy, right? But when they say first signific signification there, they mean of the word being. The claim is that the first thing that the word being means is God, because God is being without restriction. And in this whole Neoplatonic metaphysics that they're all operating in terms of, right, being itself is like a Platonic idea and all the individual beings only have being because they participate in being. There's an idea of being, which is being itself, which is being unrestricted, and it radiates or transfers or allows participation of being to all the other beings, right? Which is the same as letting them be. And that is the theological theory of creation of Avicenna. It has nothing to do with time. It's a vertical, you know, ontological support. All the, from his point of view, all the existent things, all the, all the finite particulars, in a sense, only subsist inside being. The same way that a color subsists on the surface of something. Right, the being on which they subsist, within which they subsist, is God, because it's being without restriction. Okay, so that's what he means by the first. Uh, that's what the people he's talking about mean by ends perfectism and uh, uh, the first signification of the meaning of the word being, etc. Now Heidegger doesn't accept that metaphysics at all, right? 
some of the people in his tradition don't realize that there is an incompatibility between their position on the problem of universals and that metaphysics, which they deal with just by saying, oh, yes, we're entirely Platonists about God, but we're entirely Aristotelians about, about the finite particulars, right? And don't worry about the fact that they contradict each other. That's sort of what you get in Suarez, right? Where he'll, he'll, he'll explain these uh, uh, highest concept of, of, of being and, and God equivalences in the chapter on infinite being, but it'll put it off in chapter 28, in the middle of the book, after 27 chapters on general ontology, right? Um, so, uh, and in the whole general ontology, he's explaining to you, only the particulars are real. Not only that, only the individuals are real. They're not even particulars, they're individuals, right? And God is just one individual. It happens to be an infinite individual, but it's an individual. So the 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 the, the point is uh, whether or not you have a whether or not there's a a a a Platonic overall conception and there's a notion of participation in abstract ideas as the as, as general concepts and whether or not those are metaphysical supports for things, whether or not all whether or not all that's considered the long exploded era error of Plato and we know that those general ideas are only uh, concepts in minds, right? Or even uh, general terms for things if you're a nominalist like William of Ockham, right? Those, those uh, debates are just not even discussed here, right? Mm -hmm. He treats it as settled by modern philosophy as a matter of course that the Platonic positions and all that are superseded, mm -hmm. right? And so the mm -hmm. places where the, the scholastics he's talking about have the Platonic position, he just doesn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. so. Mm -hmm acute question to bring that up. Um, but this means he's not simply understanding them as they understood themselves. He's trying to understand them better than they understood themselves, but certainly differently they understood themselves. Right, okay. Hmm. Just, just in passing, I have to note uh, how Obvious seems to me that the, the, the resemblance of that of that thinking to the idea that once once the idea of democracy or, or rather I should say representative democracy came about then the, the, the leader of a polity is is the first among equals but but he's still and he's still an individual he's still a subject uh, it, it just seems it's, for me it's much easier to understand that way I think it's I think it's the guiding intuition behind that ontology actually. Possibly, but I mean, some of this goes back to Aristotle, who is not a great Democrat, but um, but the the uh, Aristotle doesn't believe in Plato's ideas because he doesn't see where they can exist, because he's looking around for a where. And this is a fundamental split in philosophy um, uh, that persists in each of these eras, right? Um, and you know, uh, can each of them understand the position of the others? Um, rarely, usually they instead translate them into their own understanding and claim that the other person is misunderstanding something. <laughs> um, but the reason that someone like a Don Scotus is carefully distinguishing all these modal you know, uh, uh, things and has this entire complicated machinery for where is it something an idea and where is it something in the essence of the thing and where is something a universal nature is because he wants to leave room for something like real essences, for something like real universals, because he's not simply convinced that Plato has to be thrown out, right? There may be places where he accepts an Aristotelian understanding, oh, that's just an abstraction, but he's not willing to say that every uh, general essence, every general concept is an abstraction. He thinks that there are real natures in things, for example. And because Scotus is on that position on these sort of Aristotle Plato continuum over towards the Plato end of it, right? He's not simply willing to accept Suarez as saying it's just a, it's just an entity of the mind, right? Or it's just like uh, and William Bach would say, it's just a, a general term. It's just coming from language. He's not um, willing to say. It. Sorry. I oh, said so that that's interesting. By the way, I mean I didn't I didn't get to chapter two yet. So this I'm doing this as, okay. as a sure, so, so Dun Scotus is, is included in this chapter. Yes. Because, uh, yeah. Because without, without a without a ton of coverage though, he's he's mentioned because he's one of the 
there, there's a critical three in that period that are sort of the famous three positions of uh, that. And Suarez himself speaks in terms of this is what Aquinas says, and this is what Don Scotto say, and this is what I say, right? That's the structure of Suarez himself is that he's, you know, hearing all of the learned doctors before him and he's going to adjudicate the dispute. That's why it's metaphysical disputations. He's going to have every voice before him and then he's going to rule on the subject like a judge, right? Um, and so Scotus's position is presented in Suarez. It's also, you know, available uh, on its own if you go read him, but here it's mostly presented from Suarez's perspective because it's in Suarez. Um, but these, yeah. this, this fact that this fact that Duns Scotus is way more uh, platonic is not something he's going to bring out. Yeah, that, that that's that that's that's what caught my attention because uh, I mean I didn't really didn't know anything about Duns Scotus until Arn started talking about him and Life of the Mind, and uh, I wouldn't have expected it to be aligned with Plato, so I'll have to I'll have to pay attention to that. <laughs> so historically, the way to think about it is this: I mean, before Aquinas comes along most of the traditional scholastic philosophy is fundamentally uh, platonic in outlook. It goes back to Augustine and uh, uh, it still has its contemporary uh, proponents. There are people who are making sort of uh, more logical and more Aristotelian objections to it, um, the Peter Lombards and the uh, Aver Latin Averroists and so on. Um, and then Aquinas comes in and all of those things are, at the, at the, before Aquinas comes in, most of those Aristotelians are thought of as being kind of hostile to the church. And Aquinas you know, tries to say, here's an Aristotle who is safe for the church, right? And gets him kind of accepted on that basis. So there's a, a big sea change um, affected by Aquinas, although not instantly, it must be said, because there's plenty of resistance to it, to sort of um, make Ar uh, Aristotelianism tame in a theological sense. Whereas previously it was the, the wild Marxism out on the fringe to be an Aristotelian, right? Um, but Scotus is, you know, writing, you know, 50, 70 years after Aquinas, and he's not fully willing to go along with that. Uh, he, he thinks that there are elements of the previous Platonic understanding that were more correct than the uh, Aristotelian one, and uh, especially things going back to people like um, uh, Dionysus, but also things going back to people like um, uh, uh, Augustine, that he's not willing to jettison. Um, and so he, he has lots of points of disagreements with Aquinas and he's usually arguing against Aquinas. And if you're arguing against the guy who's bringing in the Aristotelian understanding, then you're you know, upholding the previous understanding. Um, there are people afterwards who- yeah, uh, It could be a case of the enemy of my enemy doesn't make him my friend, so, but, but, but I'll have that's, to see. That's certainly true, <laughs> that's certainly true. And, and he does try to, Scotus is a very careful guy who's, who's trying to put everything together. He's a kind of ironic, uh, peaceful philosopher who wants to see the best in everybody's positions and keep what's uh, deserving of being kept. But the result is he, uh, uh, but for a, a, a typical example, um, uh, Aquinas will think that the of the different proofs of the existence of God, the only one which is worth anything is Aristotle's first cause argument, right? He thinks all the other ones depend upon some concept of, uh, what the essence of God is, which is not available to the human finite intellect, right? So he, he doesn't like the uh, Anselm argument because he thinks that it, it, it makes, you know, heroic assumptions that aren't warranted and it's gonna, people aren't gonna believe it. Whereas he thinks that the uh, Aristotelian first of all argument is uh, solid, pat. Okay, so uh, some later people, including Suarez, don't like the first cause argument if it depends upon a actual mover, because that depends upon physics, and you don't want your metaphysics to depend upon your physics, right? Um, because your physics will be overturned tomorrow as soon as one does an experiment, right? Not a good idea. So uh, he thinks, you know, no, we can't, can't be having into that. So he has that uh, argument, argument against it. But someone like um, uh, Scotus, a little book like this, um, he, will, he will just go in and say, all right, uh, I don't have to decide between the first cause argument in the direction of time and causality, or the first cause argument in the direction of ascent of the of the of the hierarchy of being, uh, like a Neoplatonist. I can make an argument which uses oriented chains, which is agnostic about which direction they're in, and make a first cause argument which is also one that uh, uh, Plotinus would accept. And that's what he does, right? So he's trying to melt, you know, make peace between an Aristotelian. Uh, Aristotelian Aquinian position and a Neoplatonic Avicenna-like position and, and, mm -hmm. and 
showed that they you know, result in the same conclusion. That's the typical SCOTUS thing to do, um, is to you know, find um, complicated synthesis like that. Um, and it's modal distinction as opposed to the real distinction or the uh, distinction only in the mind is a perfect example of such a straddle. Right. This is also why you know uh, the SCOTUS got the names as uh, got the uh, uh, reputation of logic toppers, right? <laughs> you know, very fine distinctions that uh, not everybody can follow. Uh, there was someone who remarked about the compare, comparing all that to the later simplifications of the nominalists like William of Ockham, that the the difficulty with the Aquinas and Scotus machinery was it was so complicated you couldn't understand it, and the difficulty with the Nominalist position of the uh, alchemist was was so simple you couldn't believe it. Um, but uh, <laughs> it sounds like, sounds like a mythology that might be uh, endemic to the uh, to, to the to the scholastics, right? Because I mean, it's all about authority now, and it was very bad to just say, "Oh, he's wrong." <laughs> you have to like really, really work hard at accepting there, all. There, there's some of that, but but honestly, they go out at, after each other pretty hard. I mean, they 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 go through all the formal niceties of hearing the other guy out and presenting his argument and not trying not not to straw man him. But they're perfectly willing to you know go at each other. Um, it's it's uh, uh, it's not a uniform set. They got plenty of contention, but certainly uh, later people find it hard to enter all of that, especially with all the variety. Jim, a question. I had another question. I wanted to make sure I understood the way that Heidegger is trying to define something. And when we're getting into the weeds about yep, yep. Uh, rest, rest and ends and all that, where he goes through in, in depth, uh, uh, horismos, I was wondering, Ah, yes, I said that right. Does, is, does he see this? And this is the note I put, because I remember being in time. Is he meaning that as a boundary or a horizon? Because I got tripped up in that with being in time. A boundary yes. to, to these different terms, or is it a horizon? Because if it's a horizon for Heidegger, that means there's a whole new world that's about to open up. So <laughs> I want to make yes. sure. I, yeah. So so so, so he, he he reads the Greek uh, uh, horizmos, um, but he conflates it with uh, shape and boundary and outline and definition, which means he's reading it mostly as boundary. The 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 Greek word itself is um, ambiguous on the term, but there's nothing here about the particular. Um, within a horizon sense of the world in uh, Dasein, you get him being in time being referred to here. He's not seeing that in the Greek understanding of her, of uh, Horismos. He's, he's seeing this as just essence, is definition, is shape, is idea, is outline, is form, is an imagistic you know, drawing of something shape-like as being the, uh, the thing which is the the truth about the thing, um, which is a, a mathematical and geometric understanding and a very visual one of what something like an essence means. Um, and it's, it's not primarily a viewed from the inside kind of pers per perspectival or you know, a subjective pole of anything, uh, a sense of horizon. It's, it's um, the thing has an outline, the thing has a shape, the thing ends somewhere. And, because it does so, it has a, uh, a, a, a finite oneness, consistency, definition, structure that is true and conceptually graspable. And the idea that then is that radical understanding is you know, isomorphic understanding of that shape, capturing of that shape. We still think a lot this way. Uh, um, uh, we say we use the word structure or we use the word information for anything that we're trying to say is essence like, and from Heidegger's point of view, that is, um, he's just tracing that back to the Greek and that whole constellation of terms culminate in Plato's theory, uh, uh, thesis of the ideas, because idea is that shape. It's the outward look of the thing, which is that shape, which is that form. This is also why in Aristotle, as well as Plato, you see the form being called the thing which makes the thing actual, which is somewhat hard for moderns to under to, to to grasp. We often think that the form is just potential, and if you put some matter in it, then it will be real, right? You may have the plan for the Toyota, but if you don't have any uh, matter to make the Toyota out of, it's not a real Toyota yet. We're not an actual Toyota yet. It's more more accurately, right? When you put actual matter in it, you've actualized it. That's the way we tend to think about it. That's not the way they were thinking about it. 
they thought of it as the matter is just lying around being uh, a shapeless lump with no structure. And when the structure comes along and, and, and adapts and forms the, uh, onto the thing, then it becomes an actual thing with an actual essence. So the actualization of the thing as the thing which does what the essence thing that it's doing is coming from the shape. And Heidegger um, deduces that that's the productive comportment. They're thinking about making the thing, they're thinking about shaping the thing, they're thinking about sculpture. Um, and also the mental sculpture of imagination, right? Imagining the thing. Um, but uh, it's that not, not uh, receptivity primarily, from Heidegger's point of view. But uh, does that help on the horizon? And that, that's great. And I wanted to make sure before we move too far ahead, I wanted to just know if you're ever going to touch on Meister Eckhart and how oh. he tries to make the distinction with mysticism. Yes. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we didn't pass that up too far. And I, I, okay. I, I, I've got so many notes. I wanted to make sure. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. So, so, one. Yeah. so, so, so he, he does mention uh, uh, Eckhart and he, he says, partly this is just to motivate um, why you should bother trying to understand all of these uh, uh, scholastics. And he's saying, if you don't understand um, um, essence and existence the way uh, the medievals did, you won't understand he says either Mester Eckhart or um, medieval and Protestant theology. Um, uh, but the the what do we get in Eckhart? Eckhart, Eckhart is a, a mystic in the tradition of the negative theologians and the a tradition of um, Dionysus the Areopagite, who we you know got in our last reading, not the last uh, chapter, but you know books ago, um, and uh, uh, and people like um, Nicholas of Cusa. Um, at least before him, but uh, that tradition is what I'm trying to say, and uh, which is very much a um, a Neoplatonic tradition. It started from this. Uh, it's it, it's not even in the Avicenna place of uh, of, of being equals God. Uh, as he as he points out, um, uh, he's not interested in God, but God, as an entity, but Godhead as a as an as an essence. Um, yes, called, I wanted to ask about that. Yes, and the and persons we talked about the persons. I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's not. It, he's not talking about the persons here, but. Uh, okay. But uh, the certainly for all of these scholastics, one of the reasons they care about essence, essences in particular, is so much, is because of what it might might or might not mean about persons. But uh, uh, they usually just hive off uh, all of the stuff we're talking about here in this contentious way, is only about finite being, and they deal with the avoiding stepping on any uh, doctrinal landmines that way. But leave, leave that aside. The, the, in the case of Eckhart, because he is a, uh, because he's a uh, uh, pseudo Dionysian uh, Neoplatonist, right? He's got super essential essence means, super essential means a beyond being. That's what it means. Right, so he's he. Remember how we, when we were uh, looking at the ancients. We noticed that in Plato, there's a there was already the uh, the good was put was placed beyond being, and then we had uh, in Plotinus we had a level of the one that was above the level of being and truth, right? And in Dionysus we got uh, a level uh, where maybe one was equal to the good and the highest. Maybe there was a nothing above the one, right? Um, but the, the original unity is usually the highest here. And original unity as truth is kind of what Eckhart has as his idea. But the original unity is beyond being for Eckhart. It is above being. It is essence-like, but it is not, but it is, it is essence-like in the sense of ideal, not essence-like in the sense of has being in it. And it is beyond being, it is beyond the concept of being. So that's the, that's the sort of, uh, <clears throat> Eckhartian meta <clears throat> metaphysics and, and what Heidegger is pointing out here is that, there, is that this is not uh, mystical in the sense of obscurantis. It, it, is, it, it is a uh, a very elaborate metaphysics, but it, it has lots of points of similarity with uh, later German idealism. He especially mentions Hegel. And uh, I think that's correct. I also think that that's partly because they're both being influenced by the same sources. Um, Hegel's logic is influenced by Neoplatonism and Dionysus the Areopagite in particular. Um, so uh, there are these correspondences there. The, the um, Heidegger is not simply pointing this out though to praise Ma Master, uh, Meister Eckhart. He is pointing out a similarity between Meister Eckhart, later uh, Protestant theology, the Quietists and people like Hegel in uh, 
but uh, he also uh, calls this the remarkable alteration of essence into a being. From Heidegger's own point of view, this is the characteristic metaphysical mistake. They stop understanding being by reifying it. They turn it into a being. And the result is they cannot understand the actual ontological difference as it actually phenomenally presents itself to human, to human beings, right? So, and this is part and parcel of Heidegger's own anti-Platonism, if you like. Um, but he's praising Eckhart here uh, so that people don't uh, uh, see this as a something to dismiss or a too shallow metaphysics. And he's doing that in part by connecting it to Hegel, which he expects the people in his audience to care about understanding. Um, but he is also, you know, along the way, some of that stuff on page 90, this remarkable alteration of essence into a being. Um, for those with ears to hear, that is, those, the, them's fighting words to a Heideggerian, right? So, you know, uh, you, you're, you're misunderstanding the ontological difference by turning being into a being. Um, that is how he would diagnose where uh, Eckhart's um, Neoplatonic metaphysics either comes from or goes to, but it's, it's, it's his now I completely just, there's some just real, real quick side note, like you said that I just, something flew into my mind. I'm not trying to make a connection. I wonder if there's any connection. Do you know how, um, so is would with the reification, that was a big thing of Marx and Angles. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, they, uh, does that mean that you would say uh, Eckhart was probably um, no, different kind? The, the, okay, different, kind. different. Yeah, because this, this is. But, I was. I know they. I know Hegel the, the took point, it. And, the point. The point that would be fair to say is that Heidegger, just as he's willing to uh, um, ex, uh, exploit all of the uh, overtones, connotations, associations of productive comportment with uh, 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 Hegelian and Marxist theory about production, right? Um, he is willing to um, uh, exploit something similar here, right? But the uh, uh, his actual objection to reifying being is not an economic objection or a political objection. It's an ontological objection. He thinks you're 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 missing the phenomenal evidence of how being appears. Um, and to him, it's the, uh, the metaphysical mistake par excellence is to turn being into a being. Um, but you don't get that from this, from this passage. He's not highlighting that in this passage. Here he's just letting slip that this remarkable transformation occurs in, in Eckhart. He'll have to tell you somewhere else, off in a chapter about the ontological difference, that that's a no-no. If you've read Being in Time, you already know that he thinks it's a no-no, right? But Fine questions. So this is what I mean by, you know, if, you, if I get a good question, we can definitely get down into the text and, 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 and go over each piece of it. Um, but uh, I, need a, I need a prompt of which, which thing does or doesn't make sense. Did you get the part about God as himself is not on page 91? Oh God. Yeah. That's a whole, here we go. <laughs> and like the, how he had to make the distinction between what a human being is and God as being I have okay I have questions about that because well, it's like but, oh all right. Do, 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 do you remember when we were reading this? Well, we were we weren't reading this book. We were reading uh, uh, the unknown God. We this, this this person came up, but that's right. the same thing we saw there. Was the that the, the pseudo Dionysian and, and Eurogenian notion of the primal unity as being something which has to be the reconciliation of all opposites, so it has to include its negation, and you get that in Meister Eckhart and you get that in Hegel, right? Um, there's a this, there's this kind of um, almost continual tradition of dialectical uh, uh, contra uh, you know, uh, reconciliation of opposites uh, in the Neoplatonists from, uh, certainly from um, Dionysius onward. Um, and, and you find that recurs again in, in Hegel. Um, but uh, that's sort of what he's, what he's referring to here. He's, he's trying to point out that, that um, uh, Hegel famously uh, identifies the being and the nothing. Um, and uh, this is a conscious echo of Dionysus. Okay. Um, in Hegel, I mean. Okay, so, uh, and I think 
Heidegger is partly pointing that out because he's expecting the typical students in the class to have a high opinion of Hegel and not necessarily have a high opinion of the scholastics. And he wants to show them, you know, all, all of the bodies, uh, uh, if you wonder where the bodies are buried for Hegel got his stuff, right? You have to know the scholastics because the tradition is a neoplatonic tradition that goes through them to him. Um, okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Avicenna. We talked about the Avicenna in terms of the God problem um, and, and his notion of being, but the other place where Avicenna comes in here is just as a source for Aquinas's own notion. Um, and I think we saw a little bit of this in Gilson, but a lot of people here were, were for, here for that. So the, 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 the famous uh, Avicennian doctrine is uh, uh, hoarseness is just hoarseness, right? He's talking about what essences are and there are people who thought that essences were universals. And there were things that there people who thought that there could be a version of the essence which exists in the particular. And uh, there was a lot of confusion on the point. And, uh, and Avicenna cuts through it all by just saying, horse, horse uh, being a horse, hoarseness, is not you know, a universal across all horses. It's not a way of talking about the set of horses. It's not a one thing in one horse, right? It doesn't have number. All numbers are predic predicable of it. If, you know, tr truthfully, if the concept is there, right, but in itself, it includes no determination of number. It doesn't tell you if it's a thought, it doesn't tell you if it's a, if it's a, a, a an actual existence, it doesn't tell you if it's a possible existence, it doesn't tell you if it's one or many or possible, it doesn't tell you anything about that. Horseness is just horseness. It's just the ideal content of what it is to be a horse. And all the other things are logical machinery around it that you can use to say things about horses, right? But the, 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 the concept itself doesn't have any of those other hooks into it. It's, it's a free variable from the standpoint of all of the other logical machinery around it. That's the, the, the fundamental insistence of Avicenna about how essences work, how we're able to use them logically as tokens, right? And we are able to you know, notice that if I negate this thing, which says so for every, then I'm implying a there is one and, and all those sorts of numerical operations we do in logic, right? work on essences because they don't have Im any implication of number and they don't have any implication of which form they exist in. They're just an essence. And his formula for that is, you know, hoarseness is hoarseness is just hoarseness and nothing else. Um, so that convinced Aquinas, right? Uh, Aquinas, it, when he's relying on real distinction is agreeing with this entirely. Now here's the most, um, uh, uh, the weightiest consequence of that notion of what essences are. Existence is an accident which happens to things. The notion that existence is an, is an accident follows from this. It's not part of the essence of anything because we just said the essence doesn't care about whether it exists or not. It's just the essence. But, but existence is something which befalls the whole thing, which has that essence. If something happens to a thing, but is not part of the essence of that thing, it is an accident of that thing, definition of accident, right? So it follows from this machinery about essences that the existence of an actual thing is an accident which befalls it. That's the Avicennian position on the relationship between essence, uh, Jason, did essence that and, and existence. Yes, go ahead. Did that, did that also involve God? I mean, uh, the argument that uh, God's essence includes existence, existence yes. has to, so, so, from, so, the, from the Avicennian standpoint is what my question is. Yes, yeah. yes. So, so the logic machine I just explained would work even without it, but his motivation for it is, or not motivation, it fits in with the rest of his scheme in the sense that, uh, being in unrestricted sense, infinite being, God, are the essence-like thing that when something participates in it, it has being. So the accident of existence that is befalling all the finite things is an accident which is befalling them as participation in the unrestricted being that is God, which from uh, Avicenna's point of view is the same as saying, uh, what God turns to and radiates uh, uh, participation into is 
and what God turns away from is not. Right? Sounds like occasionalism again. Well, uh, he's not an occasionalist, but the occasionalists came out of the same, they were taking issue with some of this metaphysics in more nominalist ways, but it's definitely in the same theological tradition that occasionalist, uh, occasionalism uh, was. Um, uh, it's not occasionalism because he still has real essences of things, but the beings of things are conferred upon them by being itself, right? And from the standpoint of the, of the finite beings, it is an accident whether they are or not, because it's not part of anything about them. Now, by the same token, if, if, you're, if your overall being, your being in the unrestricted sense is also just an essence-like thing, but it's the essence-like thing that is the concept of existence or the idea of existence, but not concept or idea meaning only existing in the mind, but in a full platonic you know, universal real, right? Mm -hmm. Transcendent being, then that necessarily is. So from Avicenna's point of view, um, unrestricted being necessarily is, and all uh, finite being only contingently is as an accident. So can you carry that forward to, uh, to uh, essentially, you know, the easiest place to take it for me was uh, when uh, Giles in his article talked about the throneness of this Dasein, the, uh, the almost accident of, of everything that we're thrown into this particular uh, Dasein that we are. Um, is that the same thread that we're going on, or is there what's the distinction? I, I don't, I don't quite think so, because for for uh, for um, there may be some element of similarity. There is uh, certainly an accidental an accidentalness to thrownness, um, but from Heidegger's point of view, um, the the uh, human existence is never its own cause. That they're agreeing on, right? Uh, it gets its existence from another, right? Uh, and that he also, you also find in Kierkegaard, by the way, if you have point of contact of the two, two, two ideas, um, that uh, uh, the existence of consciousness is always in another, or we only subsist in the world. We don't uh, uh, exist in our own right from our own, uh, from our own selves or something like that. Um, but for Heidegger, thrownness as a structure is something which has an authentic and inauthentic reaction to it, right? And the only authentic reaction to it is um, uh, Making your own whatever you were thrown, uh, whatever you were thrown to, right? So, the fact that you were not its author doesn't mean that it's not you. That's what you are. So, um, but that's only the uh, the authentic reaction to the fact of, of thrownness. It's not the structure of thrownness itself. So that's how I would knit those things together. There's definitely a point of contact through Kierkegaard um, for Heidegger is getting some of that. But his own ethical take on it, which I think is also someone indebted to Kierkegaard, isn't something you find in Avicenna at all, right? From Avicenna's point of view, he's just trying to say all the finite beings are mere creatures of uh, unrestricted being. Does that make sense? Uh, and going back, oh, sorry, to sorry. something that you just said, uh, why is it that Avicenna uh, thought that uh, unlimited or unrestricted being or infinite being had uh, existence as part of its essence uh, sure. must have been, uh, necessarily. Sure, that's a fine question. The answer is uh, he's just, you're, 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 you're not sufficiently Platonist and literal to see why he thinks so, right? He's saying unrestricted being, which is being itself, which is all the being there is, is, right? This follows from the essence of being itself, right? It is meant to be the concept under which all instances of being fall. So all existence happens as part of that concept. All just, all just things are part, uh, uh, participate in justice. All good things participate in the idea of the good. All true things participate in the idea of truth and all being things participate in the idea of being. Therefore, truth is true, good is good, justice is just, and being is. So, so we're going it's, back it's to Plato's. Absolutely. So, be, so being is, is another form, a uh, form. Yes, and, absolutely. And the form that, that okay. And, and, and this is what you get in Avicenna. This is, uh, Heidegger himself refers to this in the chapter where he talks about the, um, uh, the book of causes. This is on page 80, 81. He said, 
uh, this is where he says, uh, to begin with, the problem could trace back to Arabic philosophy, above all to Avicenna and his commentary on Aristotle. Arabic Aristotelian was influenced essentially by Neoplatonism and by a work that played a great role in the Middle Ages, the Book of Causes, for a long time it was taken to be Aristotelian, although it is not. So the Book of Causes is a, um, uh, an excerpt, in, uh, well, uh, it's cliff notes written in Arabic to uh, um, uh, some extracts from Pophory, who is explaining Plotinus, right? And uh, so it's, it's straight Neoplatonism, but people thought it was an Aristotelian work. It was another work that circulated in, in the Arab world called, which was called the Theology of Aristotle, which was, uh, which was um, Proclus, but it was ascribed to Aristotle. So the, a lot of the uh, medieval Islamic philosophers were trying to reconcile elements of Plato and Aristotle. And you have to understand there was a big industry before them of that. People like Proclus had already been doing it in the, in the ancient world. And a lot of the commenta ancient commentators on Aristotle were concerned to accentuate the points of agreement between Plato and Aristotle as opposed to the points of difference between them. So there is already uh, a tradition and heritage in their source documents coming out of especially Nestorian Christians um, that they then translated into Arabic. And those things then circulated and uh, uh, were standard works on metaphysics um, that were translated back into Latin and used throughout scholasticism. So, I mean, uh, Aquinas writes a, writes a long commentary on the Book of Causes and treats it as a, a standard text on metaphysics, just like Aristotle's metaphysics itself. Um, so the point that I'm making is, although Avicenna is thought of as, as an Islamic Aristotelian, the Islamic Aristotelians have strong Neoplatonic elements and they're not concerned to accentuate the differences between them. Um, this is, by the way, something that kind of changes a bit with the Barawees because there were, um, Ghazali basically attacks the Neoplatonic elements as being a foreign Greek import and un-Islamic. Um, and then uh, Averroes responds to that by saying, oh, well, yes, they did put together a bunch of this other stuff with Aristotle, but the pure Aristotle, the real Aristotle, he doesn't have those problems. Here's the pure Aristotle. And that's how Averroes got to be called you know, the commentator, meaning the commentator on Aristotle, because he was going back to the original Aristotle without all its Neoplatonic accretions. But in, in, in Avicenna, the accretions are in full bloom, right? Um, it is it is a, a, a reconciliation of Neoplatonism with elements of Aristotle. Does that help? It can, if I can dig a little bit more as well, since the, since the formation of the thinking of Avicenna is uh, essentially Platonist. Now, my understanding of the Platonist and the Platonism is that for, for them, uh, reality, the, the really real is the form, the ideas, more than... Uh, what 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 we see physically physically is just appearance, if you will. So, so having uh, the concept of of real for for a Platonist are all really has to do have to do with the with the forms. So so basically, right, which right. is which is not our understanding of reality. Well, or, it, or the common understand. understanding. The moderns are all over the map on the point, but the 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 for the medievals, the ancient, the late ancients, and the uh, uh, scholastics, the distinction between real and actual is something like the essence stuff, the idea stuff, the math-like stuff is real, and the stuff that happens in time, uh, the stuff you can hit with a stick, is actual. Um, and they didn't use one term for the other. They didn't conflate the two. They didn't okay. think that something is, uh, for, for example, truths of mathematics are real for them, okay. right? Um, the yeah. poly of But what how is existence then? Sorry. In, 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 that, in that way of looking, where, where does existence fall? Sorry. Right. right. So, so uh, in, in the Avicinian scheme, right, uh, being is one of these ideas. This also goes back to the Neoplatonists. Being is one of these ideas, and everything which, everything which is participates in being in that sense. The actual is uh, the, the limited subset of the things which are, which are, uh, have matter joined to them and, and are affected by the category of time. It's the temporal realm and the material realm, which is a, a proper subset of reality, right? Think about a big mathematical reality of mathematical truth with a tiny little physical thing inside of it where time happens. Mm -hmm. That's their basic mental picture. 
so the necessary existence of God in Avicenna is that realitas or actualitas? Realitas. Or both. It's both. Realitas it's only. It's, it, well, it's it, it, uh, it's realitas first and foremost. The act the, the the actual part is there as well, but more important, it's the cause of all of the actuality is happening in time that there is. There's an out there's an outside time cause of everything that happens in time. In, in the in the neoplatonic scheme, and that's that's straight okay. back to Plotinus. That's you know none of these new medieval or Sicilians uh, in in Islam mm -hmm. and it originated that. That goes back to Plotinus, the neoplatonic tradition. Yeah. Um, thanks, thanks for clarifying. That's yeah, good. yeah, this is great. But I mean, the, the one of the questions to ask is so when it, when we got to uh, Eckhart, right? Heidegger accused them of turning being into a being, right? And thinks that this is a a distortion when he's talking about the, um, the 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 sort of theological understanding here. There's one place where he just calls it a uh, uh, runs into a blind alley. Where is this? Um, so I remember the, the thing I'm thinking of. He's trying to, uh, he's asking whether or not we can get farther with the uh, medieval understanding. Um, yes, okay, it's page 104. And somewhere you can say, actuality is not a res, but it's not on that account nothing. It is explained not by reference to the experiencing subject as in Kant, but rather by reference to the creator. Here the interpretation runs into a blind alley in which no further progress is possible. No other argumentation given. It's just the claim that uh, when actuality is traced to the causing creator, right, you're in a blind alley. And what he means by that is you're asking for origin in the direction of causation in time, not what the thing is as phenomenal as as <clears throat> pardon me, phenomenologically based. You know, what 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 is it referring to? What is its actual meaning? You're just telling me it's history and it's an imaginary history at that, but you're telling me an imaginary history of something when I asked you what it is, instead of explicating what it is. And he calls that a blind alley. So this is, his, this is Heidegger's own take on this whole Neoplatonic thing. Heidegger is not a, a, a Platonist. He's, a, he's, a, he's a, a, a fervent attacker of Platonism in, in most of its forms and here as well, he is diagnosing this um, Platonic kind of ontotheology uh, way of understanding being in in this whole medieval tradition, and he's critical of it. He thinks that his reason for being critical of it is he thinks it makes it impossible to make further progress, where by progress he means coming to a deeper understanding of what the meaning of being is to human to to, to the human being. Mm -hmm. Right? He's just trying to make progress on that ontological question: what does this being thing mean? And he doesn't think that you can answer that question. By telling me, uh, by tell you know what fairy gave it to you. I'm exaggerating for clarity. The mistake that I made there was I, I had that highlighted as well. But yes. I, just, I didn't. All I put was it was a good summary, but I didn't really question it, which that means he did a good job of getting me to go for the ride. But now that yes. I'm talk about, it, I should have questioned that more. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, but uh, uh, he, he has a case. No question, you should definitely go for the ride as well. <laughs> you don't know where it comes out. Um, okay, let's talk about productive comportment. Um, this is where he's gotten past all the medievals. We'll come back to the medievals, but he's gotten past all the medievals and he jumps back to the, the Greeks. He doesn't distinguish really between Plato and Aristotle here, but he's trying to get at what is um, actual like for the Greeks. Um, and he, he claims that the the, um, uh, the Morphe is ground, grounded in the look instead of the other way around. It's not the order of perception. Uh, it's inter interpreted with a view to the production. The potter forms the base out of clay. That's the, that's, the, that's the model. The claim is that understanding the essence of something as the form imposed upon the matter 
is the, the root idea of essence. The root idea of essence in the, in the Greek understanding, the claim is, is uh, the intentional shaping, forming of, uh, of something pre-existing as raw material into the shape that it should be for the purpose, right? Something like that. That is the essence. We would say it is putting the structure on the thing, putting the information into the thing that makes it the thing that it actually is, right? And he's claiming that that is, um, that the basis of that is both the way imagination works and the way human production works as shaping the products of art. And that we then understand natural production on the analogy of the production of art, not the other way around. We do not think of our action as imitating the way that things emerge in nature. We think of the way things emerge in nature as being analogous to an unseen potter making them, right? But our, our frame of reference is, and this goes back to things and being in time, our own possibilities for our own activity, right? Well, I'm jumping ahead a long way, but you know, eventually he's gonna come out as the dot sign is a time surfer who tries to understand the meaning of the things it encounters on the background of its own possibilities for action. And uh, that is how it has to understand possibility in general. That's gonna be the eventual claim. So we don't come across possibility in general by no notice by merely spectating the world and noticing some contingency of, uh, of correlations, nothing like it, right? It's, it's the, uh, the fact that we, we ourselves are made out of input output arcs that convinces us of causality, right? And by the way, convinces Heidegger about causality as well and, and of ways of causality, right? Um, uh, uh, yeah, so we, uh, th this is sort of what he means by productive comportment, that the human being is always plugged into the world already as a possible sphere of action because he's made out of action, out of, out of action, you know, out of actuators, right? You, you, you're, you're, you're made out of actuators. You interact with the world as, as, as uh, uh, what resists your purposes, right? Um, and uh, that's part of what, the, what Dasein is. And the claim is that all of the meanings ascribed to the beings that Dasein encounters are free projections there based upon the meaning of those things for the Dasein's own possibilities for action. So yeah, one of the places where I got, got lost on this was, uh, and you just started to touch on, so maybe you can kind of tie it in as you go. Um, I, I picked up productive comportment as almost being only about things, material things. And we live in a world of biology, living beings, uh, in some respects, so you view them as self-creating. And, and I was struggling. You kind of mentioned uh, uh, the nature there for a minute. This is what's really struggling me with comportment was uh, how does this tie into uh, a more modern understanding of evolution, of, uh, of the way in which uh, stuff grows from something else uh, and, uh, and yet is always interconnected to something else? And how does this tie in? Or is it just so far beyond Heidegger that he that he doesn't want to deal with it? So I didn't know which way, no, which they're, way they're to they're go. Great, with it. They're great questions. He does try to bring up all this stuff in uh, around page 107, 108, um, uh, where he brings in the uh, uh, the fusis and the the, the 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 way in which uh, nature makes things, etc. But first, we have to pull back for a second. He has a fundamental objection in this whole chapter to the productive comportment thesis, and it's not that he doesn't, in his own philosophy, in his own being in time agree in some fundamental sense with the production thesis. The problem with the production thesis is it doesn't leave the place for Dasein, right? The, 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 the producer is not the produced, right? The, 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 the entity which exists in a productive comportment is not just a made widget, right? His fundamental objection to the chapter is that this it may be a way of understanding the realm of nature or the realm of uh, artifacts, but it cannot be a way of understanding the being which we ourselves are, right? So, uh, or the psychology or the mind, right? 
consciousness, right? The and and so he's not putting the objection on uh, life and uh, uh, emerging presence in, in in the naturally arising living being different from the produced. He's putting it on the producer is not just a widget, right? It, it is the 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 act of the acting producer is already something mind like in a way that is not like the object that it is producing. Is the claim? Yeah. So, he, so at he that gets, point, could the could the uh, um, the the uh, distinction that we don't always like in a lot of modern stuff on consciousness and stuff is that consciousness only resides in human beings, not in not in other creatures, not in anything else. Uh, Heidegger seems to go down the path that Dasein only is only human beings. And that there no, is not a, no, a, a similar. He, 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 normally, yes. There are some other phenomenologists who are more agnostic on the question, which I think is more consistent with the actual position and evidence, right? Um, but uh, uh, I, I don't. I don't think that. Uh, I don't think anything fundamental turns on the question. The 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 um, the difference of the structure of a consciousness thing does not depend upon how wide it is, right? If, if uh, 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 border collies are conscious or AIs are conscious, you have to treat them as whose and not what's. And the fact, if, if uh, they shared consciousness with, with us, we wouldn't deduce from that, that because we treat them as what's, we can treat ourselves as what's. The deduction would go entirely the other direction. We'd have to treat them as whose as well. Right. So, the, but the claim by the end of the chapter is just that you, there, there, there is a being that you cannot understand as a produced what in this sense. You cannot ask what is it and is it. You have to ask who is it. Um, and and but that's the distinction he rested on. Along the way, he mentions the that the um, uh, the natural arising thing may be uh, may seem to be different from the uh, produced thing and he also mentions that the material out of which things are produced may not seem to be produced itself so it is not true that the product but, the, but he says that these are both ways in which things are revealed by the productive conformant itself it's from the it's from the understanding of produced things as produced by human art that you understand things which are produced but not by human art and things which are not produced all of those are still in the frame of reference of the distinction of production, right? You're just you're 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 understanding nature as that which is not art, and you're understanding material as that which is not formed but already exists before it is formed. So the claim is both that the matter concept and the nature concept are derived uh, distinctions from the core art concept. And that the core art concept is driving the interpretation. Does that make sense? And I had a question about the the passage you just mentioned on um, about uh, the who and the what and all that. But within that statement, he sort of, to me, and the question derives from this, hints at there's a what about the who's. Okay. So my question was, what is the thing that affords a who to be? And capital B E. Mm -hmm. What does he? Because I didn't think he actually says uh, what that is, but that's what I thought. I'm like, like, oh, what? What so is answer, that thing? You, you, so, so there's two two different directions. Question. One one is the sort of uh, uh, scientistic, scientifically from the outside, reifying the uh, the, the human beings uh, uh, way of looking at it, which uh, to him is exactly what phenomenology exists to get away from. Right? It's positivism, right? And phenomenology exists to see the world from the inside first uh, by comparison. But the other direction uh, to take it would be the sort of uh, um, uh, uh, Kierkegaardian one of, you know, is there some being in which uh, uh, the consciousness exists that is the support of its being? And that Heidegger might agree with along the lines of thrownness that Craig was talking about earlier, um, and also for Heidegger. Uh, very definitely in, in opposition to a lot of Kierkegaard, finiteness, right? Uh, the, not just thrownness, but finiteness um, are, you know, characteristics of, of, of Dasein. If you go read Husserl, right, he'll start from, um, it is not possible for the consciousness not to exist, right? He starts from the absolute position of consciousness. 
all of our all of our thought happens in consciousness and about consciousness and with consciousness. So the human be, uh, the human mind cannot conceive the absence of consciousness, right? And Heidegger, you know, will start from that position and then write, you know, uh, uh, the whole second half of being in time about being toward death, because you know that's too simple to be believed. Is his uh, his take on on the uh, on the Husserl version of that? But uh, these are all great questions. The point, this is why you have the whole problematic of Dasein. And what he's bringing out at the end of this chapter is just that the, the traditional metaphysics before this doesn't really have an adequate understanding of uh, Dasein or consciousness. Now, he does allow that this thought of reflection is, all, is already there in Greek philosophy. He points to Parmenides in particular and the thesis of Parmenides that thinking and being are the same. Um, there, there's all kinds of, and you know, there's, there's elements of this in the ideas as well. Um, there's all kinds of ways in which the uh, Greek philosophy was aware of the uh, mind pole of things, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. But it didn't understand them the way he's, he's uh, explaining it now. Another way to think about this is to use uh, Suarez's um, uh, um, conceptualization, right? Where he had general, uh, being in general or general ontology, and then there were three areas of specific ontology, which were uh, God, cosmology, sorry, theology, cosmology, and psychology, right? There, there, there are minds, there's nature, and there's God as the three kinds of special beings, as well as the general being that has to somehow include the ball. Heidegger in this chapter is saying the ancient metaphysics is trying to focus on understanding the nature uh, pole of that. Uh, in their self-understanding, they're also even more focused on understanding the uh, theology pole of that, um, but in a way that he thinks is reifying being. But uh, what he claims they're not understanding adequately is the, the psychology pole of that. Their, their notion of being is not wide enough to include uh, being in general because it excludes one of the three bits of Suarez's um, uh, schema. And obviously that's gonna be intro us to the next chapter because the, the moderns like Descartes and, uh, and Kant following Descartes think that they've addressed that with their, from Heidegger's point of view, raging subjectivism. <laughs> um, so so uh, there's a question about whether or not uh, uh, it's a correction or an overcorrection. Um, but the, the the next chapter will be all about how uh, modern philosophy, he's gonna especially talk about Kant, right? Tries to leave this whole realm of the, um, the human being, uh, the moral realm, the realm of freedom, whatever you wanna call it, that is not simply the natural world and that it understands the being of differently. So in that sense, modern philosophy claims to be or, try, or is attempting to be understanding more adequately the thing which Heidegger is claiming the uh, ancient medieval uh, philosophy left out. Whether or not it does so correctly, we'll have to see, but uh, uh, that's, the, that's the way he's setting up chapter three, right? You know, fanfare, you know, uh, can, can Descartes to Kant get, get uh, uh, the, the nature of, of being for the consciousness uh, so correct that, uh, did they solve all this? I think we know what the answer is going to be. Um, question. Yes. Jason, something that Craig, I think it's related to Craig's question maybe, or wonderings, and, and, and to your answer, something that, uh, it made me think about something. Now, Dasein uh, he's, is the producer. Uh, and uh, you mentioned something about uh, uh, the the uh, something not applying to the producer. I mean, that the produce. I say the producer is not simply the, a product. Yes, that's right. Right, right. Not not simply a product, which 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 uh, clearly uh, applies to design. And I was wondering, what, in in high degree, what are the other producers in nature or in existence? Are, are there are there other producers apart from design? He, he's saying that the whole notion of production is one of the basic components of Dasein and that 
our ascription of anything production like anywhere else is coming out of that uh, understanding, that lens, right? Mm -hmm. So he's not looking around for other producers. Now that we certainly understand uh, nature, well, can understand nature, not the, the, the only way of understanding nature. We, we can understand and traditionally have understood nature as something which produces of itself, right? Um, we say, you know, the, the, uh, and but we think of that as, you know, uh, the, the naturally growing as that which produces itself. We still use the concepts of production to understand it, but we don't think that it has the relation producer produce. We think that it is has the relation producer and produce being equal. But that's I the see. only the only extra twiddle that we give to nature in that understanding. By the way, when we get later Heidegger, it's not even in this book, but later Heidegger, when he gets to question concerning technology, he will claim that one of the uh, dangers of subjectivism, modern philosophies, it leads to the point where mankind becomes not even produced, but raw material, just, mm. the, just the matter to be shaped. But yeah. that, that's, his, that's his diagnosis of one of the things which is, which is possible with sort of, you can put it this way, unlimited objectification or something like that. But the, the, whether or not uh, man, man is a, a, a maker, a natural thing, um, uh, a mere raw material, a produced thing, all of those are questions that seem at stake from the standpoint of understanding being from the productive compartment, right? That's not where Heidegger wants to come out from. Where Heidegger wants to come out is man is the shepherd of being. Man is the being that understands being and is responsible for its re revelation, something like that, for its truth. So, which is meant to be a uh, something broader than and different from simply the productive comportment. Does that make right. sense? Yes, it does very much. And by the way, I thought your uh, you 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 gave a really great summary of being and time, uh, twenty five words or less. It was just amazing. <laughs> I thought, yes, that's it. <laughs> uh, I think I'm glad this is recorded because I think that has to be uh, I don't know memorialized. Put well, thank you, thank you. I, it's always <laughs> always good to know that uh, some of it comes through. I mean, I. I uh, it's all extemporaneous, so I mean, it's just if it's if I've got it, I've got it. If I don't, I don't. But uh, you, you're, you guys are the better judges of that than me. But I, I appreciate it when uh, when it when it helps. Um, okay. Uh, uh, did he make the case that uh, it was the, that the foundation was inadequate? I'm asking whether or not. I mean, obviously, there's this thing at the end about claiming that you know, uh, the DAS sign is a who and not a and, and not a what, and therefore the uh, to every the thesis of modern of ancient ontology that to every being there belongs an, an essence uh, that is what it is and the an existence uh, that is whether it is uh, that was the claim and uh, the, he um, his objection is. Um, uh, this is not true of the Dasein, uh, which is not a what, but a who. And the question is, is that a sufficient uh, objection to this whole ancient uh, tradition, ancient and, and uh, medieval tradition? Why am I asking this? Because they had an, uh, a, a, an understanding of essence that might have included ascribing essences to human being and it would call the essence of a human being a psychology and it would have a rational psychology. And it may have looked uh, uh, instrumental or in, in some ways, but that's just practical, uh, uh, the, the, the practical uh, possibilities of action of Dasein or something. But uh, do we think that human beings don't have essences? Because that's really what this amounts to. He amounts to saying the human being doesn't have an essence, it has an existence. And by the way, you might notice that the creature or the creature, the item that uh, doesn't have an essence but has an existence instead has moved from being God to being Dasein. But if someone thinks that actually uh, mm -hmm. hu human beings have essences, they have a human nature, they're in, 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 fully embedded in nature as, as finite particulars, right? Are not going to find this terribly convincing. He is he's he has so far merely um, objected 
that this past metaphysics cannot understand the human being. He has not demonstrated that it cannot understand the human being, at least from my point of view. I mean, I think in, in both the rest of this book and in being time, he has a case. I'm not saying he doesn't. I'm just saying that uh, don't take the promissory note for the accomplished fact is what I'm trying to say. Um, I want to talk about release. I think I briefly mentioned it, but this is on page 114, et cetera. He talks about how there's this moment, um, and I think this is one of the places where he's doing kind of his best phenomenological work. It's a place where he's, you know, just being a good, a philosopher noticing something. Um, uh, in, in the produced thing existing for itself, in the release of the of the uh, role of production over the thing, there is a, uh, a a letting go and a letting be that needs and wants the thing previously acted upon to exist independently of its creator, independently of its maker. In other words, there's a kind of there's a kind of uh, implicit acting ethic in production itself, which does not see the work as merely a servant of the maker. The relation is the other way around. And he even talks about how the, the, uh, uh, the, the item produced is available for use, but often not for the maker, but for the rest of the, uh, of the beings that the, uh, 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 that the Dasein is with, mm -hmm. right? Um, this is, you know, pr productive activity is not for yourself, it's for, it's for the others, something like that. So there, there's a, there's a um, one of the reasons I'm, I'm harping on this is this is a foreshadowing of one of his own, um, put it this way. Uh, there's all these places in Heidegger where he's doing something which is philosophical, but it's vaguely ethical and he doesn't call it ethical. It's not really ethical. It's, it's, it's something like a, uh, um, a, a suppressed ethics of uh, thinking and intention, something like that. And um, the releasement of letting beings be will be, you know, a, a refrain you hear lots of in late Heidegger. And this is a foretaste of releasement, is what I'm pointing out. The, the way in which the uh, uh, the created thing is let go and let be is a is a foreshadowing of the later Heidegger's focus on releasement. Yeah, my my thought or question about that whole section was. Um, that seems to be uh, how creativity works, yeah. you know, um, that it's like you're trying to discover this thing that already exists or give your best yep. uh, rendering of it, uh, for lack of a better term. Is that? Yes, kind this of is. That's right. I mean, he's, he's trying to get at the fact that um, this is why, you know, uh, Aquinas and Scotus want there to be, you know, a real essence in the thing. It, it's independent of the mind. It, it's not just some way I'm thinking about it. It's, it's, it's really there, right? It, all of them are the distance and detachment of the thing from the artist. Um, by the way, there's another echo you could, if you go back instead of forward to later Heidegger, go, go back to precursors. Um, one of the themes of the, uh, uh, in Nietzsche and of the Heidegger and Nietzsche books is the world is a work of art that gives birth to itself as this famous idea in Nietzsche, right? Um, uh, he's got uh, um, uh, another essay in his uh, um, basic writings uh, uh, on the origin of the work of art, right? Uh, the, the work as the ergon, as the thing which is the energeia, which is the, uh, which is the, uh, um, the, the activity in actualization, right? Um, as the work. All of these are related concepts in Heidegger, right? There's this, there's this um, Connecting back to Nietzsche and connecting forward to his own his, his own stuff, he is definitely trying to think about this. Uh, uh, think of it this way: the metaphysics of work, <laughs> where by work he doesn't mean you know drudge going to the office. He means more like the uh, the artist uh, sculpting uh, uh, the future. Okay, so I, I, I think I mentioned it uh, once or twice before, but um, 
116, he's dealing with the imagined objection from the audience that, you know, it can't be the case that the Greeks thought of everything as produced because they weren't yet the Christians who thought of everything as created. Um, they were the ones who thought that the universe is eternal, right? Um, now, there's a little bit of ignorance in the objection, which is an imaginary objection, so it can be as ignorant as it wants. Uh, Plato does have a, 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 a Timaeus in which a, a Pythagorean stranger talks about, you know, the, the, the demiorgus making the cosmos after looking away to the ideas because of exactly this sort of productive corporate idea. So uh, yes, that maybe he points out that, you know, this could be tailor-made for the Christian worldview, but it's already there in Plato, right? In that confluence we've talked about in some of our previous sessions. But um, uh, certainly it is true that there, uh, Aristotle is for an eternal world and he doesn't see the world as created in time and, and, and so on. And that's sort of the objection there. And, uh, Heidegger then tries to bring out that material is what is already there is itself a category of the productive comportment. Um, the thing which is noteworthy in this is this is not just meant to be a, uh, he mentions it practically in passing, this is not just meant to be a sort of um, aside. He's claiming this is the origin of the idea of matter itself. Not necessarily, he's certainly not claiming this is the origin of matter itself, but this is the origin of the human understanding and meaning ascribed to the concept matter material. And it's why the Aristotelian uh, uh, physics and metaphysics are all about um, uh, form and matter. And the, the, the full being is the, is the uh, informed matter, right? Uh, so this is right on page 116. In the course of producing and using beings, we come up against the actuality of what is already there before all producing products and producibles. What, what offers resistance, the formative process that produces things, the notion of the resistance, by the way, goes back to Fichte. Um, the concepts of matter and material have their origin in an understanding of being that is oriented to production. Otherwise, the idea of material as that from which something is produced would remain hidden. The concepts of matter and material, heil, that is the counter concepts to morphe form, play a fundamental role in ancient philosophy, not because the Greeks were materialists, but because matter is a basic ontological concept that arises necessarily when a being, whether it's produced or, or is not in need of being produced, is it interpreted in the horizon of the understanding of being, which lies as such in productive comportment. So you just have to recognize that this man has just claimed to give you, have given you a genealogy of the concept of matter. If you're not, you know, uh, I don't know if, if the right word is suitably impressed, it might be suitably unimpressed, but uh, it might be, you know, uh, where's the chutzpah, but uh, he's claiming that uh, so basic a human notion has a philosophically explicable necessity, right? And that, and that he's found it, you know, in, in front of you. It's 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 things like that, um, whether they are um, fulfilled enough, fleshed out enough, that to me make Heidegger a uh, interesting, challenging, fun philosopher to read. Right? He's full of things like that, where you know. If, you, if you're skeptical about whether or not he's actually proven it, right? If you want to kick the tires of it, you know, entirely correct, but he's, he's making uh, striking claims that other philosophers will be, you know, uh, proud of as their, uh, as their main contribution to uh, human thought, you know, as a sides. <laughs> Yes, so Wouldn't he kind of leave out all of the ancients preceding Plato by doing that? That how can he, as you're just saying, people had fleshed it out the way that he would put it in the history of metaphysics. Because obviously there's ancient texts, I like, go on and on that, sure. that try to touch on. Sure. And, and, and uh, I, I mean, he, his claim is that the, uh, the Greeks with a certain kind of uh, directness and naivete, you know, un understood these things. But uh, um, there's no question that it's older than these particular than those particular thinkers, right? If you're claiming the origin of something, right, it's not the origin in the in the in the true uh, 
historical causation sense. It's just the origin in the same thought sense, right? The claim is that the same thought that occurs to Plato and Aristotle here occurred to, you know, whatever myth maker, you know, had their, you know, uh, 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 matrix mother or whatever uh, uh, in, in, you know, time out of mind. The claim is that it's the same thought coming from the same uh, stable structure of phenomena of human existence, not that Plato had this idea and it influenced everyone since, it, since then. Great question. And so what he's saying here by uh, the matter is a basic ontological concept that is interpreted means the, you know, matter itself is understood uh, phenomenologically by man, not necessarily um, something that things have already. Um, and I, I think the point against Plato is that uh, Plato says that the forms are eternal, immutable, permanent. Uh, and uh, Heidegger is saying everything is interpreted by man. That they're, they're, because man is finite, you know, he's not saying it right here, but because man is finite, uh, we, we could say that, you know, uh, there's certain things that are permanent, like mathematics, but all things in the world are interpreted by man. And Uzia is not something uh, immortal, but depends on man to say, this thing is here before me. Possibly, but you have to ask, is the productive comportment as a possibility of man supposedly uh, just an interpretation? Or is it meant to be part of the structure, an unchanging structure of, of uh, Dasein's life world, right? Mm -hmm. you, 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 can, you, can, you can put either level below that and you can ring the changes on every way that each of the medievals thought about the universals on it if you want, right? He can be discovering structures uh, that are uh, um, uh, permanently there uh, as, as possibilities of, of, of uh, human understanding, or uh, he can be just relating a uh, particular historical interpretation that was a particular direction that human thought happened to take when it could have gone otherwise. And he's not able to settle the question here by just by pointing to an instance like that. It doesn't settle the question. Right, but if he's pointing out the instances of the different historical periods where things have been interpreted in different ways, and yes, he is looking for the structures that underlie every possible interpretation. Yes. Uh, whereas Plato, Aquinas, whoever, are particular interpretations. So, so I agree with you that he, he thinks that being, the meaning of being, as he understands it, has a history, right? Um, but whether or not, uh, how optional any of the structures in that history are, I think is an open question, Heidegger. Um, he sometimes comes across as a, uh, as a, um, a free form historicist of, you know, uh, the, the, the free reaction of the individual thinker, right, to the particular uh, crisis or conjuncture he is in can change the uh, future trajectory of the history of being, right? Um, and, you know, that's what gives the, uh, the, the weight to uh, every uh, thinking decision of, uh, of, uh, of the thinker, right? And sort of that, um, uh, intentional ethics of acting taken from the stage of the ordinary life to the stage of how the thinker engages with being itself. That moment is certainly there, but especially in the later Heidegger. In the earlier Heidegger, it sometimes look like, looks like he's just uh, discovering 
invariant structures of the life world that are meant to be as objective as Kant's transcendental ego. And uh, the line between them seems pretty blurry. And it's not like uh, him, him going from one to the other just because he says so is sufficient reason, right? Um, you have to ask, are the things, are the uh, structures being discovered just uh, Heideggerian poems uh, uh, in, to speak Nietzsche uh, 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 that, that could be otherwise? Or uh, is, he, is his evidence better than that? Right. I think I think he thinks his evidence is better than that. But go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, but and yeah, and yeah. So at this time and, and being in time, he's explicitly looking for this fundamental ontology. Yes. And then you know why doesn't he complete being in time? I think it's because he realizes, yes, this fundamental ontology can just be interpreted as another great man coming up with his understanding uh, of being at a particular historical time. I, and... I, I, first, first of all, I entirely agree with that, but I also think that uh, uh, the result is just that he comes up with notions like shepherd of being that are meant to be the gone meta on that problem. Right, and their rightness itself is... Right. It's, the it, event is the most fundamental thing that has to be behind all the yeah, knowledge. Yeah, but I mean, that one is so trivial that, you know, it could be a Nietzsche, right? I mean, <laughs> but but, but I, I, I'm, I'm being a little bit more serious that I, when you're right that he does notice those things, but when they, when they happen, his reaction to them is not to uh, um, uh, tell you how wonderful it is that he managed to discover that everything that he uh, 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 has to teach you is uh, only his perspective embedded in his horizon. Instead, he tries to tell you some uh, uh, even more grandiose, more meta thing that is not so limited. Yeah, right? that's his project. It's his characteristic yeah. activity, is the way I put it. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it's a fine question. Sorry, sorry. Nick, was a question? Well, yeah, kind of going back to your, with your reading, uh, that the concepts of matter, uh, the concept of matter and Oh wait, the concept of material. The concept of matter and material have their origin in an understanding of being that is oriented to production. Yes. That you you brought us into that section. Yes. And and that kind of made me think that uh, it, it does have a productive comportment. I mean, one can argue that. But what about when I look back and think about it? The idea of matter became important. For the Greeks, through Thales, through the physics system, my Miletians, who were wondering about uh, what what, are, what is the basic uh, essence or material of the universe or, or Earth, and then that's where they started. Yes, they want to know what speculating stuff. about Earth, water, about stuff. That was how it, it but, started. But, uh, Not, sure, sure, sure. It, it starts. It, it starts off with trying to ask, what stuff is is the world made of, right? And the, the the, the, the what stuff the world made of, the stuff part is usia. And the answer to that question winds up being being, right? In the, it, it, yes, there are more naive ideas earlier, but they get to the indeterminate and they get to mind and they get to being. And then they discover, okay, and being has a structure, it has form and matter. And matter is the discovery that the being of which things are made is substance, which is in every case composed of form and matter. So he's presenting that as a as a uh, a process of discovery. He knows there are earlier rungs in it, and as uh, Jim pointed out, there are you know traditions way older than the Greeks that knew about uh, uh, you know a, a a notion of a prime matter or matrix from which things things arise, right? So th the thought is there even earlier than that, but he treats that history as having an internal necessity to it that, you know, it's going in a direction, the earlier rungs in it aren't standalone positions on themselves. No one's gonna remain stuck at the Thales level and think that Thales answered it correctly. No, no, no but I, I, they, I guess I'm quibbling all, with, all the, with the idea. All the, all the, all the waters and, 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 and ethers and fires are pointing towards yes. the actual concept Heil oh, in Aristotle's to claim. Okay, I, I, I guess I could, I, after digesting that, I could maybe do it. But I, I'm just right. coming I mean, with the idea of the origin of the conception of, of matter of, of is, is based on our productive uh, uh, comportment. And, and, that, and that is the, 
but whereas historically the origin seemed like came from a curiosity of trying to explain nature and how it works from from the, its basic matter. It has nothing to what, do with, sure, with production what, what, at sure, all. But, well, hang on, hang on. What does it mean to say how nature works? You're using the term works. What is working? Or, or what is made up of? Uh, no, no, I, I, sorry, you, you, you sure, use sure. the term work and I think it's, it's okay. useful, right? Because mm -hmm. that's exactly what he's saying. He's saying, we try to understand what it means to figure out nature by asking how nature works. We know what work is because we work. We wanna know how nature okay. works, right? So we're using the fact that we have a structure for understanding how we work to try to understand how nature might work. We're understanding natural action on the analogy of our own action our notion of action itself, our notion of working itself, is coming from our own possibilities of action, is the claim. Okay, so 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 nature as a producer again as well. Well, it's it, just because call if, it a, if, just if, call it a, just call it a worker first. Just, just work, sure, producer. sure. Something that works. Well, the, the Greek word for work is energia. It's energy, hmm. and erg is the work. Right, a unit of energy is a unit of work. Is, is this also kind of getting tied in with when he said, okay, this is a participle and here's a noun and how we can parse between the participle and the noun and let's make sure we get that right. Okay, so, 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 so not quite the same. So let's back up to that one and, and get that one straight. So when he's talking about the, 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 the participle and the noun, he's talking about the different ways in which uh, 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 being is understood, right? And the first point, it's a point, the fundamental point there is that uh, as the noun, it, it designates the thing which is, the being as something in the world, right? Uh, a thing, a thing-like thing. Um, but that that is a derivative secondary meaning from a first meaning, which is performing the act of existing, the noun version of being, right? So the claim is that there's something uh, more fundamental about the the noun version of being as something which is doing, a doing. The, 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 the uh, medieval Aristotelians uh, said that the, uh, the essence is the act that the existent being performs, right? What they mean is that the horse does horsiness, right? The ship does shippiness, right? The, 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 uh, and that doing, the, the existing is the performing of the action of its essence or shape. So this is what this is the actualization and the, the workly type and the actuality involved in the existence. It's the claim is that that is first and foremost the noun version, sorry, the, the, now the, the verb version of being, you know, persisting through time, performing the same action that is of your essence, right? That that is the uh, the, the core existence idea, and that the uh, uh, turning that into a thing which persists and does that is a natural uh, generalization of that. It's, the, it's saying one of the things that does that thing that we understood, right? We already understood what it means to say this thing does its essence through time. It's one of those things. Now we turn that into a noun and we can point at them, right? But we first noticed that the thing does this continually. And by the way, that Although there, there certainly are echoes of that or precursors of that in um, the medieval Aristotelians, Avicenna in particular, um, a little bit in other ways too. But uh, it's also something that Husserl, his immediate teacher, um, made a lot of. Right? Husserl was all, was all about explaining that the the thing is the intentional object of consciousness is never just a set of experiences. Right. It's always got to be some persistent structure that you can uh, that, that unifies your uh, your, pre, your your percepts, right? The thing needs a stability through time before you organize it into the notion of this thing, right? And your and your and your intended object of uh, a concept of the table, right? Always includes potential things the table could do, what the table would look like if you walked around it, and other things that you've never experienced about the table, but could or imagine as possibilities around it. So it's always got this big, fuzz, uh, this big uh, fuzzy possibility ball around it and it has to persist, persist through time, right? That's what things are like for us. Things are not snapshots of a you know, plane of vision. 
And we know this even from modern AI. You can't, if you take a snapshot of plane of vision and show it to the computer, it has, has no idea what any of it is. You have to tell it to look for persistent structures that have these invariants in it before it even recognizes that anything is there. Right? So I had two questions attached. One, I want, is this, in, is this tied in any way to what Nick was getting at? Uh, I was trying to see if maybe there was something with the matter question that had something to do with that, but I did have another question. No, I don't think related to that. I mean, I think Nick's question was more about the uh, the, the historical genealogy of this, and, and I agree with him that that uh, it is not the case that you know no one had the concept of matter before Aristotle. Um, people certainly did, but uh, the Heidegger's claim is is that you know the concept of matter in Aristotle's metaphysics is the culmination of that line of Greek musing about. Uh, 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 material and working and actuality and actualization that uh, culminates in the um, in Aristotle's metaphysics is the claim. Um, okay, and so the, the, there's a secondary question I have uh, along these lines, and I'm, I'm glad you kind of brought it up. Okay, I had to do with AI. So, it, you know how um, part of the problem I think with the perspectival thing, me it reminds me of Gibson's uh, theory of uh, ecological theory of visual perception and that there's actually ambient light and not just reflective light sources. And the ambient light actually has information in it. So that there's actual real things that exist in the universe. And so um, that would kind of go against what Heidegger's saying. And that uh, what, what I was gonna say with AI is, uh, does that play into how it has to learn to perceive visually? Because if we say it's all just a construct in our mind, then we're, so, we're, we're negating so, so, Gibson's bottom up so, theory. So, so I don't think that uh, all concept in his mind is where is where uh, either Heidegger or Husserl before him is coming out. I was relating that to Husserl, right? It's it's Husserl who tries to talk about how um, the thing is always bigger than just our our, our um, perceptions, right? Uh, it, it has to be some uh, integrated organizing unity which uh, um, comprehends, explains, uh, uh, you know, it's it's a it's a hypothesis. Uh, behind the behind the percepts that explains the percepts, right? And it always has to be that. It always has to be bigger than the percepts, or or it, it's completely useless, right? You cannot organize experience by just uh, uh, correlating percepts, so to speak. You always have to organize it by the. Um, uh, it's not just reductive positing across the percepts itself. It's also a generalization across them, and the the, the thing which is needed for uh, having anything like a concept of a thing or an object. Is that your generalization? You're trying to generalize in ways which are bigger than just your past experience of the thing, right? And as a matter of just practical AI, you know, the, the thing that got you know computer vision to work was when they went to these uh, convolutional neural networks that uh, uh, don't just re uh, recognize shapes; they also force themselves to ignore everything that doesn't generalize in specific ways by throwing out half of their data and by you know, throwing out things which aren't you know translation invariant and these other kinds of things which means that if a certain regularity isn't there and a certain ability to generalize isn't there, the algorithm is forced to ignore it, right? And if you don't do that, they don't work, right? So uh, th that's, I don't think there's anything in particular to Heidegger. I'm just saying this is the kind of thing you see in Husserl. When Husserl is trying to explain how the perception of objects works, the reason he's explaining it in that kind of detail is he's trying to um, disabuse people of the positivist notion that the uh, concepts we have of things are um, merely ways of talking about large numbers of the perceptions or something like that. That the actual referent of, uh, of all of our thoughts about things is just the perceptions themselves and we're organizing classes of them. That won't work. That's not how even uh, creation of a uh, object concept works. And you can tell that by direct inspection. You can tell that by, you know, both logic and direct inspection. And that's basically what, what Husserl did in, you know, his early logical investigation stuff. Um, and all of that I'm just explaining is background for Heidegger. He's starting from that at the level of the theory, at the level of the integration of the experience as a passive observer. And what Heidegger is trying to do is add the all the pieces that he thinks Husserl left out of that, which is the non-theory-like, the non-visual-like, the non-logical, the, the, the practical, the structure of the life world, the you know, finiteness in time and all that kind of stuff, uh, the angst, the care, right? All the aspects of 
uh, human existence, which aren't simply akin to a computer trying to understand the pixels on the screen. Does that make sense? Whereas Husserl right. just wanted to figure out even how you could, a human being can figure out the pixels on the screen. <laughs> yeah. Um, these are all good questions. Uh, we did a bit of Husserl back in the spring. I, there's a few. We actually did Levinas on Husserl. Um, if you want to look that up on the website, um, there's just a couple of lectures on it. It might be helpful for some. Um, okay, I want to just, I want to, um, still going to take questions and I still, I will, I'm willing to go back into the classics and more detail if people want it, but I, I want to uh, give a little bit of um, preview. So we already learned from the end of this one that the problem with the traditional classical pre-Kantian or at least pre-Cartesian uh, version is that it did not have an adequate place for something like the consciousness. And the claim is that the modern, modern philosophy, modern metaphysics, is uh, supposedly going to remedy this. So this is the title of chapter three is the thesis of modern ontology, the basic ways of being are the being of nature, res extensa, extensa and the being of mind, res cogitans. So that, that's going to be the, the um, attempt to update the, uh, the previous critique to uh, uh, have, a, have a more adequate understanding of being which means it has to be an understanding of being which can understand the difference in the beings of these two different kinds of beings, uh, as well as what they have in common in both being being, something like that. Um, now, the, that distinction is traditionally thought of as Cartesian, right? It's Descartes who really draws that. Um, most of the subject matter of the, of, the, of the chapter, though, will be about Kant. Um, uh, Kant is, is um, Definitely in that tradition, he still has an uh, ego cogito, et cetera. But um, one of the reasons that he's that he Heidegger is going to be going to Kant is Kant has a much more elaborate um, uh, philosophy of morals, um, philosophy of uh, something like uh, uh, freedom, freedom of human action, something like that. Then you get explicitly in Descartes. So um, uh, it's going to be about the thinking thing and the extended thing. Or the realm of nature and the realm of mind probably is the right word at the time, but later it's in the German, later German idealism, that those would be distinguished between the realm of nature and the realm of freedom. But uh, uh, that's the sort of uh, content distinction uh, that the next chapter is gonna be about. One of the things that's gonna be going on there is what to pay attention to is there's lots of people who um, in reading Heidegger think there's uh, it's noteworthy that there isn't a morality in Heidegger, or the only morality is the morality of authenticity. The only morality is the morality of thinking properly, or you know, something like this. Um, some of that is there's evidence against that in the next chapters. I'm going to tell you. And but part of this is that it's not always easy to tell where Heidegger is just explicating Kant and where he's actually agreeing with Kant, or is a Kantian on the point. Um, there's a little bit more of that than you might think, although that may go away later. The time when he's writing this, he's not so down on Kant that he's not going to agree with him on a, a substantial number of things. Um, but uh, people may have different different uh, opinions on that or reactions to the things in the chapter. But um, I am excited to see how he gets into uh, res extensa and res cogitans and whether or not he looks at those as two distinct um, ontological planes. You know, yes, but, and I can, you know. I can, I can already tell you that. I mean, the, 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 uh, uh, he's not going to be, as I, you know, foreshadow, right? He not, not, it's, it's not hard to figure this out. You know, he, he's not going to be giving this whole explanation to say, and nobody needed me, right? Uh, uh, so, uh, <laughs> so, so he, he's going to find, he's going to find problems. He's going to find inadequacies. He's going to find ways in which they didn't ask the right question, which is his question, right? And especially where. Um, there isn't an adequate grounding of any of this in the uh, uh, in the phenomenological experiences of uh, human existence, something like that. But he is going to give Kant credit where he thinks he deserves it for um, not just being uh, a Suarezian, if I can put it that way, in, in some of the in some of these ways. Um, uh, what else? I mean, th th all of this is meant to be 
the uh, of the three things in Suarez's uh, uh, four things in Suarez's uh, um, general scheme. This is the the rational psychology, the the the, the, the philosophical anthropology um, uh, version and chapter. But uh, I think it's fair to say that the for much of modern philosophy, they're primarily interested in the mind for what it tells them about what can and cannot be known about nature. Uh, Kant to his credit is not simply in that case. He, he cares also about uh, things beyond that. But for a lot of the modern philosophers, I'm thinking people like Spinoza and, and uh, in particular, um, they only care about understanding the mind uh, because it is necessary to understand the instrument which we, with which you were looking at nature. But understanding nature is still the purpose. And understanding man is kind of, you know, afterthought or who cares. Um, that is not there in Kant. And that's one of the things I think Heidegger likes about him. Um, but the, the place where he's gonna come out is something like Kant's fundamental understanding of man is that he has to be treated as an end not as a means, right? That's, he's going to, he's going to, um, uh, okay, that's just enough foreshadowing, you read the chapter, but um, there's elements of that which Heidegger is gonna agree with, and you'll even see versions of that agreement in his later essay concerning technology where he, um, uh, it is the violation of that norm that he finds problematic, something like that, um, but, uh, uh, he doesn't find it sufficient as a grounding of the nature of the being that we ourselves are or as fundamental ontology. Saying that men are ends or consciousnesses are ends in themselves is not telling you enough about what the being of uh, that, we, that each of us is means, right? It's too, it's too limited uh, a point, right? But that is where he does see something in Kant which um, agrees with his criticism in the previous chapter that you have to uh, uh, you have to ask of Dasein who it is, who he is, not uh, what he is. Um, that is going to correlate with the, with that point in Kant. Anyway, I just want to point out: uh, f f watch for the places where he agrees with Kant, and watch for the places where he thinks Kant is in inadequate. Um, uh, it's not simply. It's not all takedown, let's put it that way. There are places where he agrees and, and it's worth tracking them. Um, okay, that's enough uh, uh, foreshadowing. Uh, the, we need to have a, um, a time. Uh, I see that Mike had to leave. Okay, that's, that's fine. Um, uh, so normally we've been doing this on a three week cadence, but I'm open to others if people uh, have requirements that would have us doing the next chapter on the 30th. Is that bad for anyone? It's the last Sunday of the month. 30th works, the 23rd doesn't. 30th is good. Okay, so I think- Works several, for me too. Several thumbs up. So we'll plan on, it's just chapter three, the thesis of modern ontology uh, uh, um, and all its sections, just up until the beginning of chapter four. So that takes us to what, page 176. So it's 50 or odd pages, three weeks. Um, And we'll have two more sessions after that. But um, in addition, especially for sort of new folks, uh, if you have questions in the meantime, feel free to send them either uh, post them in the either in the meetup on the group or send me uh, questions in email. I'll try to uh, uh, talk about the next time. You also can just raise questions at the beginning of the next session if you think of things along the way. Um, uh, it may sound like I'm wrapping, but I've, I've still got plenty of time to. Uh, uh, take questions, uh, get your guys' thoughts, uh, throw the floor open to have reactions to anything we've gone over or questions about anything we've gone over. Uh, no no hard Jason, stop at this point. Jason, I wonder, since you're already kind of foreshadowing a little bit, I wonder if you could extend that to the later chapters. What, what are we looking forward to and where will it end? Where, why does it end with temporality and what, and where's the meat? Because I don't want to yeah. miss the meat this time. <laughs> Just, <laughs> Fair enough. So the, in, uh, the meat in the next one is especially the the agreement and disagreement with uh, uh, human beings as ends elements of the morality of Kant and with what degree is the morality of Kant something that Heidegger ascribes to 
and to what degree does he think that it's inadequate for his own problem? That's sort of me to the next chapter. The one after that is kind of going to be about logic, and it's really large portions of it are negative in the sense that he's trying to show that the effectively the positivist attempt to simplify the question of being into a triviality that we don't need to worry about don't work. That's sort of what chapter four is focused on, if I could put it in a nutshell. Um, uh, chapter five is this positive stuff where it's going to be temporality. So he's going to, all of the previous stuff was reaction to other people. Um, he has been making his points along the way, obviously, but he starts ex, uh, something more expository about the, the ontological difference and then temporality. What is, why, why temporality? The, the claim is going to be that we, and this is echoing the claims of being in time, that the proper horizon to understand what being means to human beings is time. Uh, uh, being awareness and being meaning uh, have to do with time consciousness. Um, so that try, trying to substantiate that claim is going to be uh, the first thing he has to deliver. He has to show that uh, he has deepened the understanding of being that all these previous um, traditions had. He's taken them to a, a deeper level that has explained the problems they were stuck in and has based it in more in the phenomena, more in direct experience, more in direct evidence, internal evidence, um, by understanding being on the horizon of time. That's just general project with being in time and, and this book, and that's why temporality is there. The other thing he's going to do in the chapter that he would have spent more time on if he had more time to work with, I think, is the ontological difference. It's what is the difference between uh, being and beings? How do we understand the difference between being and beings? What is being like? Does being have structure? Does being change? You know, there's, uh, what, is being, uh, what do we mean by being in general as opposed to just the beings? Um, and the claim, is, the broader claim that he makes in being in time and there is gonna be that uh, that's a problem that has previously not been focused on enough in, in tradition. He doesn't really go into all the things he's going to do with that uh, uh, in his sort of later uh, work, but the uh, if I had to foreshadow at least one of the main points, it would be that uh, being has a history. It's not just static. And uh, man is involved. He's not a passive participant in being. Um, those would be the two main things to look for in, in the, in the last chapter. Does that help? Yes. And, and just on being and beings, the ontological difference, is that a, you know, that's the first time I, 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 I encountered that term. Is that just, a, is that a classical term or is that Heideggerian? It's Heideggerian to make so much of it. And certainly people afterwards, you know, uh, uh, harp on this as the difference, right? Um, there are lots of things which people previously would have called the most important difference. We saw some of this last chapter, where they would say the most important difference is between infinite being and finite being, not between being and beings. Um, so uh, that particular formulation of it and that harping on it is definitely Heidegger himself, but it's not like people didn't previously know about this distinction. They just understood it in a platonic way or they understood it in a theological way or they didn't have his understanding of it. And the characteristic thing in Heidegger is that the, the being pole of that is uh, radically different from what the previous people thought it was. Um, he's not thinking, when he's thinking about being, uh, he is not thinking about the same things that other people thought they were thinking of when they thought about highest genus or simplest concept or uh, uh, anything like that. It's not that simple to him. It, it's much more involved. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's his. It's not just a traditional thing. Fine question. OK. Uh, Jim, I know you got through some of your questions, but I'm wondering if you have another stack of them that you haven't uh, unleashed, which you often do. I, I got through all of it. I don't know if you can hear me still. I can, I can. Yeah, yes. my video's dying, I think. <laughs> I'm getting ready to be booted out. Um, I, I actually had all of them answered and then some. 
Okay. Um, but some of them were questions that were answered as you went through the text. Of course. So I was like, well, there's no point in asking that. Um, but no, it was as uh, I, I got to ask a lot of those questions and had them answered. So thank you. Okay. Um, throw the floor open. Other questions or other comments on uh, either anything we've gone over or how to go in general? <clears throat> Joe. Uh, I just had a silly thought that deserves to be left to, to the end during a moment like this. Uh, earlier, um, one of our participants asked a question about, um, uh, for example, other conscious, we might even begin to suggest yes. sentient animals. Yes. And I was, I was puzzling over that because clearly to the design, uh, they are extant, but to themselves, to the extent that they have any perception of the of the being, the universe around them, uh, you might say they're a little micro dot sign that was also cast into the system. I mean, that created by the mother dog or whatever we're talking about, or the mother horse. But it, it's almost a silly idea because I'm shifting the focus here by saying, well, I understand the design orientation because that's clearly what I, as a human, am going to do when well, I even address this. But is it possible that the, the, the tortoise in my backyard also has a smaller perception well, of the uh, world? Well, 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 of course, right? But uh, the, the operative word is possible. But the, the um, uh, so, so first of all, there is a, um, a kind of scientistic view that Heidegger himself is strongly resisting, which treats uh, the, uh, sense of existence of other people the way you treat the question of the sense of existence of the dog right um and this is part and parcel of the uh treating people as what's not uh who's and probably as a result of that not necessarily as ends in themselves we'll get to the next chapter uh that he is resisting but independent of those consequences, he's also resisting it just because he doesn't think that it is illuminating for understanding. Okay, so in in, in that sense, he's always going to you know start off with things like you know uh, Dasein is the being with which each of us uh, individually is right, and he's not going to uh, treat that as something which is he has to prove to you or is up to debate. You just know it, right? And if you if you don't admit it, you're lying, right? Simple, right? But there are certainly uh, people who think that they intuitively understand their Kali and treat it as a Dasein. But we don't know if that's an illusion. It could all be projection, right? When I say we don't know, I, I don't really mean that we don't know. I mean that people have different opinions about that and the evidence on it is not gonna convince uh, uh, everyone either way. I have my own opinions about it, but uh, uh, there are of the, a let a thousand flowers flowers bloom variety, but uh, uh, I, I don't I don't think that they're important for the philosophical side of it. Until right? the dog can actually speak to me in English and, and communicate that it has. Uh... <laughs> no, I, I, I get your point. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I don't yeah I, I I don't I don't think there's all kinds of things you know uh, Turing tests and communication and language and all those things. None of those matter to me. I mean I I think all of them are shallow and they're 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 not philosophically important here. The, the philosophically important thing for Heidegger is the element of the consciousness question, which is a fundamental ontological question. What kinds of things are and what does being mean? That's the question. And that question does not turn on whether uh, on, on the extension of the concept consciousness. It, it depends upon the essence and the, and the intention the content of a concept consciousness, not on how wide it is. So that's why I, cons that's why I usually just consider it a distraction. I, I know that, uh, and I, I would even say there's a, a, a modern uh, uh, technological and uh, uh, scientific fascinated lens that wants to make that the central question. And all of its motivations for wanting to do that are bad. When it's mere curiosity, there's nothing wrong with it. When it's actual, you know, phenomenological interest, there's nothing wrong with it. If it's even a psychology experiment, there's nothing wrong with it. But most of the desire to distract from the content of what consciousness is for us, to worry about what the consciousness is for dogs, are as much running away from your responsibilities as any other, uh, you know, uh, frivolous distraction. 
right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the point of uh, Heidegger and engaging with Dasein is to uh, make it your own Dasein, it's Eigenlijk, right? Authentic means your own. Um, uh, and so you won't understand that by focusing on everybody else's. By the way, this also gets to a point that uh, the author Craig um, mentioned, uh, uh, posted about, brought up in his essay. He talks about how he he uh, um, he looks for all the places where Heidegger is going to tell him that uh, uh, love and service to others are the most important thing, and he doesn't find it. And he finds this that this makes Heidegger seem cold to him, right? And Heidegger just treats all those things as distractions. I mean, he's got a definite concept of the they. He also has a definite concept of being with, and is even has concepts of morality, but none of them issue in in a um, you don't have to worry about your life because there are other people. You well, start he also to has a concept of care, and this is part built in. Of course, care care is the fundamental structure of Dasein, but uh, th th that care is often the care of the Dasein for itself. Is is the point that uh, Craig's author is pointing out, right? Well, there, there's there's a there's an individuality which borders on selfishness in Heidegger that uh, is offensive to the sensibilities of those who are always looking for other feeling. This is a, this is something which brought out by one of his students, Levinas, who tried to make you know uh, the the ethics of the other into the you know the basis of his understanding of things, right? Um, and Heidegger is definitely not that kind of person, right? When Levinas went in that direction, he was definitely opposing something he sees in Heidegger, and he's rightly in Heidegger. I don't have a problem with that thing in Heidegger. Um, I think it's just a, a uh, uh, it's an individualism certainly, and beyond that, it's a seriousness. And I think that Levinas is usually unaware of the degree to which his ethics of concern for the other is often running away from himself. Um, and I think that he's not the only one. But uh, anyway, that's that just takes us very far afield into Levinas. And you know, Levinas is worth wrestling with in his own right. But uh, you asked. Check. Um, a couple of different things, um, and they're, they're relatively minor, so they're definitely worth waiting until the end. Um, I, I don't notice, I, I think this was an excellent discussion. I've learned a lot from it. I will learn even more when I listen to um, the uh, recording. So number one, um, when you record, does the recording come to us automatically, or do we have to go back to you and ask for a recording of a particular session. You don't have to go back and ask. Uh, what I do is at the, at the bottom of each session, I post the link to my YouTube page that has them all. If you follow any one of them, you'll get to all of them. Oh, okay. I so will... if, you, if you just go to, if you just go to a, like last, last uh, three weeks ago meeting and you look in the, on the meetup page in the comments section down below, you'll find okay. a link posted there. But once all you've right. got it, you can just bookmark it. And it's, it's always up on the same page. It usually takes me, you know, several hours after the session because it has to be you know encoded and uploaded and all that kind of stuff so it's usually later that night that'll go up okay well um as a person who's very uh non-technical yes <laughs> i can i can assure you i will probably um send you an email about this and it's absolutely fine you can just always ask me a question about an email and i'll just send you a direct link if necessary and, and confess that i have uh, failed to find it number two um uh, there are many times when I don't catch a joke in English, and then you have all these unusual words that are showing up in Heidegger. Uh, I'll just focus on one, comportment, okay? Yes. Now, I think I have a sort of an idea of what comportment means, but I'm, for instance, let me just ask the, the question. When he spoke it in German, what word would he have used for comportment? And does, do we need to sort of mine some of these words and terms that we find that are a little unusual in Heidegger or other philosophy, of course, but in Heidegger in particular, because uh, his use of them may also reflect a peculiar usage, even in his own native German. So yes, it's, it, but it's, a, it's definitely a peculiar usage between uh, Husserl and himself for that word, of that comportment. It's not something you'll find you know, in colloquial German. Uh, that he's uh, making use that word. It's a term of art for him, but uh, uh, it does have precursors in, in, in Husserl. 
Um, I'm not recalling the actual German word involved in that. In some cases, it does matter to, to go look at those you know, connotations, and others it doesn't. Um, and I'll also point out that you know, multiple people were talking about how much more difficult it was to read this chapter because of all the untranslated Latin in it, right? So sometimes you, you, know, you, you say, uh, I, I want to see it in the, in the original terms, it'll be uh, clearer, but if you get enough of the original terms, you can't understand it. Right, so people are chicken and egg. You 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 pick pick a horn, you're going to get gored, right? But um, the the uh, uh, in the case of what comportment means, right? This is a term which is it's it's a derivative of intentionality in uh, um, in Husserlian uh, phenomenology, right? We ought, we talked about intentionality in the first time about this. Uh, uh, um, the Dasein acts intentionally in the world and uh, has. Uh, uh, it relates to things uh, uh, that, that transcend itself, right? That transcend the consciousness, and it, it knows that it transcend, they, they transcend the consciousness, and it intends those as the uh, objects, the uh, things upon which it is oriented in both its perceptions and its actions. Um, Heidegger's way of putting that is the Dasein is always already with beings, but th the point of that is to distinguish between uh, relating to your perceptions, right? Uh, his, his example was, you know, I do not walk around the lecture hall, you know, avoiding my perceptions of the wall so as not to fall into my perception of the courthouse, the university building, right? You're, you're, the the, the DAS sign has windows to the outside, people like to say. It is always plugged into the outside. It is not an inside that is not that is uh, windowless. Um, it's not even an inside. It's always already outside, is the claim. That's just about um, intentionality. Comportment is discussed in more detail in being in time and it's more something which Heidegger himself develops. And it's the idea that there is a, um, uh, something like a, a total attunement to its own possibilities, whether of understanding or of action, that can include a mood, it can include you know, uh, care, it can include you know, the, the reason that uh, uh, something matters, um, as well as anything as simple as um, percepts or anything uh, atomic like that. The, the point is that, um, uh, there is a, a, a total orientation of Dasein's being on things, right? Which is not just a viewing, it's not just a per perceptual, it's not just a theoretical thing. And that's what he means by comportment. It's, it's, it's a, a reorientation of Dasein's own being to task, purpose, uh, uh, understanding, perception, whatever. Anything of that nature, he uses the term a comportment and he'll distinguish between different kinds of them. Right, so different kinds of comportments can have their own structure. They can have their own involvements. Um, all of them are characterized by care. That's the thesis of being in time is the underlying unifying structure in all the comportments. Um, and what are the typical Heideggerian um, formulas you'll get out of that, right? Um, uh, uh, Dasein is a being that, uh, that, that understands being. Dasein is a being that understands its own being. Dasein is a being that cares about its own being. Um, uh, you know, it is uh, Dasein is a being that is afflicted with care. Uh, Dasein is anxious, right? All, all of these are um, elements that are common across comportments, but they characterize comportments. Um, and there's a whole theory at the end of being in time on, on, on the the temporal aspects of them. These are not something which are just instantaneous, right? They are they are um, time extended things, right? Related to you know. Uh, possibilities of action and possibilities of being, right? Something like that. But so, comportment is a is a a basic psychological, anthropological, um, existential uh, term in uh, Heidegger. But what it's trying to get at is something like uh, none of these things are simple, atomic, um, um, merely mechanical, right? All of them are integrated. All these different aspects of the of the human being involved. Does that help? Yes, and in particular to know that uh, it's developed further in being time, which some year I may eventually tackle. But um, <laughs> uh, you know, I I, I was folk, my sort of commonsensical, bare bones English understanding was to think of the word orientation, and you used orientation reorientation just now in your yes. explication twice. That's part of it, yes. But, I, but that's part of it. And now I understand that it is that comportment as 
Heidegger has used it and develops it further in another text uh, is a broader and, and deeper term. So that's fine. And then one other also sort of semi-technical question is that uh, I don't know if, you know, in the midst of all this conversation today, you had a chance to notice, but uh, our um, participant from Greece sent a very long comment in chat. Mm -hmm. And will you have that when you when you leave this conversation or not? Uh, because if I don't I was if, I, if I if I don't copy it when I leave, then I won't. But if I do copy it, I might. So uh, good of you to point well, it out. Uh, I can try. I, I have <laughs> I have already copied it uh, as okay. an email to myself, and I'll forward it to you. Because I, yeah. I also, as I glanced at her at her concerns, I also thought they were rather interesting, uh, very different. And um, I can understand why she put it in a chat because it was not immediately relevant. Although in fact, it became relevant in the process of our conversations later on. So I think you will find it interesting. I'd like to forward it to you. And then when you have a chance, if you do reply right. so, to it, so, I'd like to... Yeah, so, so the, the, the main thing I see that just looking it over is that it's primarily about a, uh, um, a set of thoughts that are in a somewhat later Heidegger, not that much later, but in the 1930s, in the period when he wrote uh, um, the question concerning technology. Um, uh, there's a whole, um, a whole problematic or uh, um, Heidegger has an understanding of what he thinks the metaphysical uh, um, view of the modern world uh, uh, in his day and time, in our day and time, uh, basically is. And uh, um, so he, he's ascribing uh, a, a position, not just in the history of thought, but in the history of, uh, of uh, human civilization reality being um, at the present time, right? And part of that is an understanding of the uh, um, general civilization things. Part of it is an understanding of the, uh, uh, the age of Nietzsche. Part of it is an understanding of the age of uh, technology as he understands it. Um, and uh, the triumph of modern science, something like that. Um, but there's a whole, a whole bunch of those things going together in which he sees um, dangers to man's historical philosophical uh, mission, so to speak. Um, and the, the, the short form of that is uh, um, uh, man in the midst of, the ch of, of, of uh, all of this, uh, um, exalting himself as, as the uh, Lord of the earth is in danger of becoming real, real raw material to be ordered into future ordering by uh, the possibilities of accumulating more, uh, uh, more, right, uh, of, in various und undefined ways. Um, but uh, there's a there's a loss of um, a potential loss of philosophical depth as well as a loss of the Kantian moral thing of man should be an end in himself. Um, of man not being a thinking being anymore, man no longer even having the status of the object, but man being viewed merely as raw material, as resource. Um, and that's sort of what he's getting at in the question concerning technology. And what I see is um, most of this question is um, taking for granted that that diagnosis is correct and asking questions about it. Right, it's not challenging that diagnosis on his part, but it's adopting the standpoint of Heidegger's view of uh, of the question concerning technology from that essay, and then you know asking where you know questions about that. So that's how I took the question in the chat, and it's a fine question to be asking about Heidegger from someone wrestling with Heidegger, especially those parts of Heidegger. But it's not something in our text. It's you know it's a, a decade later, and not for a whole bunch of other stuff happens um, and you know it, it might be worth uh, talking about sometime but in the standpoint of our conversation here a little bit of a distraction um, as a as a separate breakout you know one-on-one -on -one and for anyone else interested a perfectly reasonable thing to talk about so I'll, 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 I'll go ahead this clarified time frame is this uh, post World War II no before it's in the 30s so it's in the 30s uh, before or after his Nazi. Uh... After. Hang on, hang on. Question concerning technology is 1951. Uh, the original. And it's based on the Bremen lectures in 49. 
49. What was the stuff in the third? I'm thinking of in 36, 37, 38. Was that the turning? Contributions to philosophy. Okay. It's later than and I thought. That's then. where he talks about Machenschaft and stuff. Okay. When, when did he have his first engagement with some of the younger stuff? I don't know. That was published in the 50s. I'm not sure when he wrote I agree it. with it was published in the 50s, but I thought some of that was, that's what I'm thinking was, I thought some of that was published in, in the 30s. Yeah, he, he might have actually started in the 20s with Junger. I, I, that, that one I don't know, but the technology stuff with the Gestell okay. starts yes, after yes. the war. Fair, good question. Thank you for the correction. So there you go, Craig. It's, it's yeah, later, 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 later than I thought. Yep. Excellent question. And I'll, I'll, I'll go uh, for next time, see if I can find out when the first younger stuff was. Younger stuff, that's sort of where he got sort of put on this track. It, was a, it wasn't only him who was thinking about that problematic, so to speak. Um, okay. Other Wait. questions, comments from others who've been quiet? I'm Dave. Oh, sorry. Uh, the date for the next one is uh, January 30th at 1 p.m. Uh, uh, Mountain Time and uh, just uh, chapter three. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, uh, everyone, for uh, joining. I, I have, uh, oh, I have a question. Mechanical sure. one. Uh, sure, sure. Pete, Pete, could you uh, uh, spell your website phonetically? Buying, you said with a, you said being with a Y. Everything, every combination I've tried doesn't seem to work. <laughs> uh, well, let me see. Where can I get the chat? It, it's being with a Y instead of an I. So B E Y N G. B B E Y N G. Uh, okay, that's the only the only one I didn't try, of course. <laughs> yeah, and that. Whoops, I just spelt it the normal <laughs> way. Uh, it, it's the it, it's a technical term in Heidegger. Gee, I can't spell today. <laughs> and I think right. it's this keyboard on the laptop. It's just super sensitive. You have to take out the I there and put, it, put the in the Y. Then you got it, right? So. Yep, that's right. Uh, it's a little too spacey today. Thank you. Why, why, Thank why, you for... why not I ask the question instead of focusing yourself? <laughs> Yeah, so thank you for doing this. Sure, absolutely. Uh, 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 glad to have you. All right, and as I say, uh, uh, do the, um, put up the recording a little bit later tonight and uh, look forward to seeing as many of you as possible next time. Thanks. Bye. All right, have a good night. <laughs>